knowledge knows no country because it belongs to humanity and it is the torch which illuminates the world the philosophers from the ancient time tried to spread their knowledge and realization about the nature among the people beyond any sort of boundaries our intellectual ancestors always had a quest about natural phenomena and the passion of learning drives them to find the scientific truth behind those phenomena or facts with that great passion we are going to start our today's scholastic discussion a very good morning to all of you i'm dr chunki choudhury assistant professor of department of botany jongipur college murshidabad i'm delighted to welcome all the delegates present here in our today's webinar on plant responses to abiotic stress organized by department of botany along with the collaboration of iqsc jongipur college i welcome our teacher in charge of jongipur college dr nabakumar ghosh a very warm welcome to dr bikash kumar panda coordinator of iqsc of jongipur college and organizing secretary of today's webinar a very warm welcome to our two resource persons professor zahid hussain and dr ravi gupta i welcome all the scientists faculty members scholars and students who have participated in this webinar from not only different states of india but also from different parts of the world i would like to welcome all the faculty members and colleagues of our jongipur college according to great thinkers sufferings become beautiful when anyone bears great calamities with cheerfulness not through insensibilities but with greatness of mind undoubtedly webinars are the easiest avenues for sustenance of continuity of sharing ideas and knowledge in these pandemic days so our motto is to spread the passion and love of learning all over the world through these webinars today we have two eminent speakers professor zahid hussain head of the department of botany in kolani university and dr ravi gupta assistant professor of college of general education kukmin university from seoul south korea they will deliver their talks on the topic based on how plant responses to the abiotic stress factors i'm pretty sure in next few hours we will be infused with the scientific sparks from their valuable talks prior to the beginning of the inaugural session i would like to say a few words about jongipur college the organizing institute of this webinar the college is situated in the semi urban area of murshidabad district on the bank of river bhagirathi it is established it is established in the year 1950 with the purpose of giving higher education to the students from backward rural population the college is affiliated to university of kollani and is a nac accredited college with b double plus grade in cycle 2 during this long course of time our college has served that purpose very efficiently of giving education to the students and has become epitome of educational cultural and socio economical aspects of murshidabad district jongipur college offers undergraduate courses in science arts and commerce and distance post graduation courses in few subjects we hope this consortium of scientific discussions will enable our students to think bigger in their future now for the official inauguration of today's scientific discussion sessions i would like to invite dr nabokumar ghosh the teacher in charge of jongipur college and request him to deliver his introductory speech dr nabokumar ghosh is a very good teacher and a great administrator he is serving his duty as teacher in charge of jongipur college from the year 2014 in his early career he has served the role of laboratory instructor in chemistry laboratory of kollani university for 18 long years 
he has a very strong academic background too he has published 11 papers in different national and international journal of repute the book written by him on practical syllabus is very famous among the students of different universities he has been awarded as best practically experienced person and teacher recently by the government of west bengal for his politeness and helpful nature he is very much famous among the students and all other staffs of chongipur college now i request dr ghosh to kindly deliver his introductory speech over to you sir Hi. Yes, yes, you may start. You are audible as well as visual. Sir, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Can you raise your voice a bit? The voice is very faint. Now it is, uh, is okay. Now it is all right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, everybody who joined us. Sir, <coughs> sir, sorry, sir, one minute, sorry to interrupt you, sir, please bring your speaker in front of your mouth, sir, actually the speaker is to side away, that is why sound is not coming out clearly, so speaker, yes. The, the speaker of your hands free, your cord, the speaker of your cord, please bring it in front of your mouth. Thank you for 
Thank you, sir, for your invigorating speech. Now, it is my pleasure to greet Dr. Bikash Kumar Panda, coordinator of IQSC and honorable member of governing body of Jongipur College. Dr. Panda is a renowned mentor, a knowledgeable person, and a very good human being. He did his PhD in inorganic chemistry in the year 2005 from Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. He joined Jogipur College as Assistant Professor in Chemistry Department in the year 2006 and acted as Departmental Head of Chemistry from 2010 to 2016. He is a member of Board of Studies of Chemistry of Poland University. He is a devotee of academic pursuit and has 39 publications in international and national journals. Four textbooks published by him are among the best sellers in different academic levels. Dr. Panda gracefully manages his administrative duties in college with his various multitasking skills. I'm pleased to request him to kindly deliver the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Chumki, for your very nice introduction. Good morning, everybody. Today, I feel great honor and pleasure since I get a chance of saying something on this auspicious day. Our Department of Botany, in association with Internal Quality Assurance Cell, organizes an international webinar on plant responses to abiotic traits. 
Thus, on behalf of IQAC Team Jongipur College, I would like to give thanks to our president of the governing body, and I am grateful to the other member of the governing body for their strong support and dynamic approach. I also like to give my heartiest thanks to our teacher in charge, Dr. Navakumar Ghosh, for giving us inspiration. I am thankful to Mr. Suman Karmakar, Assistant Professor and Head of the Department of Rotani for his great initiative and acted as a convener in this webinar. I am also thankful to Dr. Chumki Chaudhari, Assistant Professor of Botany, for her great energy and enthusiasm, who acted as a joint convener. I am grateful to Dr. Soumo Mukherjee, Assistant Professor in Botany, for his excellence and constant effort, who acted as a coordinator in this webinar. I am also thankful to all the other members of the Botany Department and all the members of IQAC and Advisory Committee for their great energy and enthusiasm and constant support. I also appreciate the help and technical support received from Mr. Sikanto Bosak. In this occasion, I am very much grateful to the resource person, Dr. Jahid Hossein, Professor and Head, Department of Botany, University of Kullani, and Dr. Ravi Gupta, Assistant Professor, College of General Education, Kukim University, Seoul, South Korea. I am very much thankful to them since they managed their time from their busy and tight schedule. Now, I just want to throw some light regarding the objective of this webinar. We all know that plant lives in constantly changing environment that are often unfavorable or stressful for growth and development. These adverse environmental conditions include biotic stress such as pathogen infection and herbivore attack and abiotic stress such as drought, heat, cold, nutrient deficiency and excess of salt or toxic metal like aluminium, arsenic, and cadmium in the soil. Drought, salt, and temperature traces are major environmental factors that affect the geographical distribution of plant in nature, limit plant productivity in agriculture, and threaten food security. So, plants often experiences unfavorable environment mental condition such as high salinity, drought, cold, heat, depletion of soil nutrient and excess of toxic ion, etc. that hamper the plant growth and development. Now I just want to mention few effects of abiotic stress towards plant. These stresses not only play a major role in determining the crop yield and productivity, but they also contribute to the differential distribution of plant species across different parts of the earth. About 90% of the arable lands around the globe are susceptible to one or more of the above traces, causing up to 70% annual yield loss of major food crops. The changing climate is further aggravating the impact of abiotic trace factor on overall growth and development of various crops. It is believed that exposure to salt rays in irrigated land has been increased by 37% during the last 20 years. Moreover, the occurrence of drought is increased due to alteration in the evaporation, transpiration, and pattern of precipitation caused by global warming. As per a recent meta-analysis study, a further increase of 2.0 to 4.9 degrees centigrade in the average earth temperature by the end of year 2100 is speculated, which will further impose 
a huge challenge for sustainable agriculture in future. Now I just want to highlight some point about plant responses to abiotic threats. Plant respond to different environmental constraints through complex intricate mechanism. The ability of plant to adjust to differential environmental condition is directly or indirectly related to two major plant strategies. Plant trace avoidance and plant trace tolerance. Plant trace avoidance is a physiologically non-active phase like mature seed, while trace tolerance is an active reversible adjustment which is generally referred to as acclimation. Acclimation through trace is particularly mediated through profound changes at the level of gene expression. During the last few decades, researchers have focused on organizing and elucidating the different component and molecular partners underlying abiotic trace responses in plant. Several attempts have been made to produce crops with improved abiotic trace, adaptive traits, including drought and salinity. <clears throat> However, one of the massive challenges in modern sustainable agriculture is the development of abiotic trace resilient crop with new and desired agronomical qualities using different approaches. For this purpose, understanding the mechanism by which plant perceive trace signal and further transmit them to cellular machinery for activating adaptive responses in is of huge importance. In this context, marrying the various physiological, biochemical, and gene regulatory network knowledge is essential that will add up in the development of stress tolerant high yielding food crop cultivars. Therefore, a holistic understanding of the different responses associated with abiotic stress adaptation is essential. Plant face several types of variation in their physical environment that hampers their growth and development. They respond to these oscillating environmental conditions through a series of external and internal changes. These stress specific responses are associated with an array of molecular players that modulates the morphology, anatomy, and physiology of plants. Abiotic trace triggers secondary effect in plant by producing excess of reactive oxygen species, which have greater impact on plant survival. In trace plant, the most useful oxygen molecule turns to be lethal and inflict several damage to the cell. Due to the increase in human population, there is more demand for food and hence agriculture practice must feed more people. This increasing demand must combat with new strategies that are to be enforced to enhance crop productivity. One feasible way to combat trace problem is to develop crops that are more tolerant to abiotic traces such as drought, flooding, heat, salinity, chilling, and freezing so that many new land can be brought under cultivation. Although traditional plant breeding method provide marginal relief, genetic engineer offers fastest and effective strategy for dealing stresses problem, particularly in enhancing plant tolerance to trace. In nature, several organisms have evolved resistance behavior that enable them to survive in extreme environment. One of the most classical ways of improving stress tolerance is to access and assess and characterize resistance genes that confer these properties and can be introduced into higher plants. With these few words, I am really feel very much exciting for hearing the valuable lecture from our distinguished 
and renowned speakers and i am sure we are all will be benefited and able to learn many things about the plant responses to abiotic stress its strengths dimension interpretation and prevention now i welcome from the core of my heart all of the participants which include student research scholar professor and various other dignitaries from different kind of profession i am grateful to all of you for being with us after all i wish the grand success of this international webinar what ever i thought we are already running behind the schedule time so i just stop here thanks to all of you for your patience thank you sir for your <clears throat> enlightening speech thank you for sharing your pragmatic and realistic views with us now i will be pleased to call upon mr shuman karmakar the head of the department of jongipur college and the convener of this webinar he is a very affectionate teacher and a very student friendly person i would request mr karmakar to kindly deliver the keynote address and would also request him to kindly introduce our first resource person professor zahid hussain over to you sir thank you dr chunki choudhary a very good morning everyone on behalf of the department of botany jungipur college murshidabad i would like to extend my heartfelt welcome to all those present at this webinar i would like to express my sincere thanks and appreciation to the tic dr navakumar ghosh and iqsc coordinator dr vikash kumar panda of our college for their permission and cooperation in organizing such an international webinar on behalf of the department of botany i would extend congratulations and best wishes to the two eminent resource persons dr jahid hosan and dr ravi gupta who are present among us our department will always be grateful to both of you sir for accepting our invitation i am very much grateful to srikant boshak for his technical support the title of today's webinar is plant responses to abiotic stress i hope we are all well but in fact we are actually going through a lot of stress because of the current covid-19 pandemic situation although we are always trying to stay good similarly plants feel stress because they live in a constantly changing environments that are often unfavorable or stressful for growth and development in plants stress describes those conditions that adversely affect plant metabolism growth development and productivity plant stress factors are mainly categorized into two main groups abiotic factors and biotic factors biotic stresses include a wide range of plant pathogens uh, such as bacteria fungi and viruses and also herbivorous animals the abiotic stress factors that most commonly influence plant performance include deficiencies or excess of water drought and flooding extremes of irradiance excessively low or high temperature or deficiencies or excesses of several nutrients including macro and micronutrients high salinity and extremes of soil ph there are a number of plant responses that stress triggers like altered gene expression cellular metabolism changes in growth rate and yield etc in plants there are several stress sensing mechanisms like physical sensing that is the mechanical effect of stress on plants such as contraction of plasma membrane biophysical sensing that is the change in the protein and enzyme structure metabolic sensing that is accumulation of reactive oxygen species biochemical sensing and also epigenetic that is the modification of the dna and rna also plants have different signaling pathways that are activated in response to abiotic stress like calcium protein kinases protein phosphatases ros signaling 
activation of transcriptional regulators and accumulation of plant hormones. Therefore, a comprehensive understanding of different stress factors, stress processes and signaling pathways is very crucial for the management of economically important plants. In this background, today's webinar topic has been selected. I think through this webinar, we will be much enriched by the speakers. Now I will introduce uh, Dr. Jai Dhoshan, the first speaker of technical session one. It is my great privilege to introduce you all to Dr. Jahid Hossain, sir. Dr. Jahid Hossain is currently acting as a professor in botany at University of Kollani, West Bengal, India. He received BSc degree in botany from University of Kollani in 1998 and completed his MSc in botany with specialization in cytogenetics and plant breeding from the same university in the year 2000. In both bachelor and master degree, he secured top position in the university. Dr. Hossein pursued his PhD research work at the NBRI, CSI Institute, Lucknow, as GRF and SRF. Dr. Hossein's research interests include sRNA, transcriptomics, plant proteomics, plant responses to various abiotic stresses, including heavy metals, nanoparticles. He has a long track record in the field of plant responses to environmental changes also. He has published research articles in journals of international repute with a total impact factor more than 150, age index 24, I-10 index 30, and more than 2,600 citations. He is an active member of the board of reviews in various journals of international repute Currently, Dr. Hoshan is serving the prestigious journal Frontiers in Plant Science as topic editor of emerging roles of ABA and hormones in orchestrating plant responses into low oxygen conditions. Moreover, he acted as guest editors for the special issue plant proteomic research for the journal International Journal of Molecular Sciences and Plant Proteomics for the journal Proteomes, MDPI, Switzerland. He also acted as reviewers in many internationally famous journals like PLOS One, Proteome Science, The Nucleus, BMC Plant Biology, etc. He delivered many popular lectures in India as invited speaker. He also delivered several lectures in abroad like China, Japan, Spain. His research group currently investigates the plant responses towards different abiotic stresses at the physiological, biochemical, transcript and proteomic levels. He is currently working with many well-known foreign research collaborators. He already completed two CSIR and one DBT funded projects. Now, he was honored with many prestigious awards like in 2021, he received the most prestigious Shikharatna award from the Department of Higher Education, Government of West Bengal. He is the recipient of DST SARP First Track Young Scientist Fellowship 2008, JSPS, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science Invitation Fellow in 2014. He also recipient of Boy Scout Fellow in 2010 to 2011. He is the recipient of membership award by American Chemical Society in 2015. He also received the certificate of editorial achievement in recognition of contributing as guest editor in internationally reputed journals. He secured the top rank in WBCS West Bengal College Service Commission for the two consecutive times. And also in 2002 CSI net exam, he secured the position in top 20. He is the recipient of merit scholarship in undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Now, I welcome Dr. Jahid Hossain sir to start your valuable lecture on role of miRNAs in abiotic stress responses in plants. One important message for the audience, if you have any questions during the session, please leave a question in the chat box. We will address 
these questions during the interactive session. Please, uh, sir. Uh, uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shuman Karmukar, for your nice introduction. So it's been a pleasure for me uh, to deliver a talk uh, in this international webinar uh, jointly organized by the Department of Botany uh, and the IQSC sale of Jongipur College. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nabukumar Ghosh, the teacher in charge uh, of this college, and Dr. Bikash Kumar Panda, the IQSC coordinator, uh, head and all the faculty members of the Botany Department for inviting me. So without wasting time, I think uh, we should start. Uh, so today's lecture topic, uh, I think first I, I uh, should share my screen. Just a second. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It okay. Visible. Okay, just a minute. It's coming. Uh, so uh, today I'm here to give a talk on the topic that is the role of microRNA in abiotic stress responses in plant. So uh, before starting, uh, we should know what is called stress. Uh, I think uh, you are already uh, know about that. But still, uh, so any unfavorable condition or the environmental factor that basically limits the crop production or that may destroy the biomass is known as stress. So broadly, we can categorize plant stress into uh, abiotic stress or abiotic stress. And the abiotic stress, uh, it primarily includes uh, the salinity stress or the stress that comes from the excess amount of salt in the soil. Or it may be a different forms of water stress. It may be a drought or it may be a flooding or it may be a different forms of temperature stress, very low stress, it may be a heat stress, it may be a frost stress, or there are different Im uh, nutrient imbalance uh, that also uh, exert some level of stress, or there may be uh, different forms of light stress or heavy metal stress. Uh, it's, it's maybe for the, it may be due to the presence of excess amount of arsenic, cadmium or chromium, or, or any other heavy metals, or uh, it may be comes from the nanoparticle stress. And the biotic stress, it mainly includes the plant infection caused by the bacteria, fungi, virus, insects, or nematode, or any other uh, pathogen. So being sessile, uh, plants are constantly exposed to various forms of abiotic stress. It may be heat, cold, flooding, drought, or salinity. So uh, plants, like other aerobic organisms, they also require uh, the oxygen for efficient production of the energy. And uh, uh, during this reduction of oxygen to the water molecule, uh, various forms of reactive oxygen species, namely superoxide radical, hydrogen peroxide, uh, hydroxyl radical, or the singlet oxygens are formed. So whenever a plant experiences any form of stress, whether a biotic stress or abiotic stress, the delicate balance between the formation of the reactive oxygen species and the quenching activity of the antioxidant get disturbed. Uh, as a result, the excess ROS are generated and these excess rods they basically uh, cause the oxidative stress damages to the lipids proteins and nucleic acid so during the course of evolution plants have already developed a very robust antioxidant defense mechanism to cope with these stress so in this antioxidant defense mechanism it includes both enzymatic system and the non-enzymatic system and uh, they just uh, try to keep the ROS level uh, within the limit so that plant cell can be or the organ can get protected from these toxic reactive oxygen species. So the slide showing basically the interconversion of different reactive oxygen species starting from the oxygen. So each stage there is a one electron reduction and that leads to the formation of various forms of uh, super, uh, the reactive oxygen species like superoxide radical, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radical. So uh, most of the cellular components, but particularly the chloroplast and the mitochondria, these are the two potential uh, cell organelles, uh, which are the main source of the reactive oxygen species within the cell. So this is the ascorbic glutathione cycle that is operating in most of the plant cell organelles. And it comprises of five antioxidant enzymes, uh, namely the superoxide dismutase, the ascorbate peroxidase, the monodehydroascorbate reductase, dehydroascorbate reductase, and glutathione reductase. So in addition of these enzymatic components, there are two non-enzymatic components are there. 
one is a ascorbate another one is a glutathione and both are present in a both oxidized and the glutathione and the uh, reduced form so uh, in combination of these uh, enzymatic and non enzymatic uh, components of the ascorbic glutathione cycle plants always try to uh, keep the ros level within the limit just for protection of their cellular components so these are the different omics techniques that are being used to uh, to explore the underlying molecular mechanism of plant stress responses so today i'm going to highlight the microarnomic approach uh, for better understanding the uh, mechanism plant uh, underlying molecular mechanism of plant responses towards the different abiotic stress so uh, so how you know that a plant is experiencing a stress condition that's uh, first i think we should know uh, so this is a comparative photograph of uh, you can find this is a left uh, panel this is a 7 day old maize seedling so this is a control setup and this is a stress cadmium stress uh, maize seedlings here we imposed 100 micromolar of cadmium chloride uh, for 4 days and after 4 days you can this the picture was taken and after 4 days of cadmium stress uh the clear symptoms of uh, heavy metal toxicities are there so these symptoms primarily includes the uh, leaf tip yielding followed by the dry so here you can find the first leaf it's completely dried up and this is a stress plant and this is a control plant and in the second leaf this leaf you can it, it already started uh, showing the early symptom of the uh, cadmium stress and interestingly the such kind of uh, there was no such kind of uh, every I mean, toxic uh, symptoms are there in case of control leaves so uh, as i mentioned that uh, under uh, stress condition there is an excess formation of the reactive oxygen species so one can uh, i mean uh, locate the tissue accumulation or these uh, accumulation of these reactive oxygen within the tissue so uh, th there are two very easy uh, i mean in vitro techniques Uh, histochemical techniques are there one is called one stain is called nitroblue tetrazoleum uh, actually uh, this one is a control leaf and this is a basically a stress cadmium stress leaf so after the chlorophyll removal you can find there is no uh, spots or uh, brown or the blue color coloration is observed whereas here after the nbt stain followed by the chlorophyll removal we can find very uh, thin strips of the blue color and this is the enlarged microscopic view of this particular area so here you can find these blue coloration which is basically the insoluble formazan and that basically indicates the deposition of the superoxide radical uh, similarly uh, uh, if one can do a dab staining and after chlorophyll removal in case of here we found we found that these brown spots uh, were observed and these brown spot this is the enlarged microscopic view these are basically the uh, indicative of the uh, hydrogen peroxide accumulation so these are the two very basic uh, histochemical staining that can be done in any lab to detect the formation or the accumulation of reactive oxygen species under the stress condition uh, in different uh, organs so uh, again one can do a fluorescent uh, you can use fluorescent dye here it's a dcfds stain and this is a dhe stain uh, this is basically a, uh, you can find this is the root tip of maize Uh, root and uh, this is a stressed cadmium stress maize root after staining with the dcfda so uh, uh, under the microscope uh, fluorescent microscope you can find these kind of uh, uh, green uh, coloration so uh, intensity of the green coloration is much higher in case of cadmium stress maize root root tip so that indicates the higher uh, accumulation of the h2o2 within the root tissue and similarly uh, one can do a dh staining here you can find the uh, red coloration is there but the intensity of the red coloration is uh, completely higher in case of cadmium as compared to the control and so that also includes the, that also basically suggests the um, higher accumulation of the superoxide radical under the stress condition so uh, one can do a histochemical staining to locate the uh, accumulation of h2o2 in the tissue by uh, using a dab staining or dcfd but one can even measure the h2o2 level within the tissue through spectrophotometric method or uh, additionally one can do uh, start uh, one can assay the uh, mda level uh, that basically a uh, indicator of the uh, lipid peroxidation that uh, gives an idea about the nature of the uh, or the impact of the plant stress on the uh, cell membrane 
So these are some of the parameters that one can check. Even one can do uh, expression study of antioxidant gene just to study the modulation of these genes under the different stress condition. So uh, by upregulating of antioxidant genes, plants always try to scavenge the reactive oxygen species so that it can give protection to their uh, cell component. So this is uh, in, in, uh, after doing the uh, QRT PCR, one can even validate that data with a Western blotting. This is basically the protein expression level. So these are the uh, Western blotting uh, pictures of different uh, antioxidant proteins, glutathion reductase, uh, cytosolic APX, and copper zinc So uh, now the question is, uh, what are the big players that basically regulate the gene expression at the post-transcriptional level? So broadly, we can categorize RNA transcript into two broad categories. One is a protein coding mRNA that basically specifically poly, encodes polypeptides, whereas the another group is non-coding RNA transcript, and they remain untranslated. Therefore, they do not specify any polypeptide. And these non-coding RNA basically uh, comprises of housekeeping RNA that includes the tRNA, rRNA, or the telomerase RNA. And there is another group under the non-coding RNA transcript which has some regulatory function. These includes the microRNA, the siRNA, and the PV interacting RNA. So these non-coding regulatory RNAs basically are responsible for the post-transcriptional gene silencing. So today I'm going to highlight the role of this particular uh, non-coding regulatory RNA, that is the microRNA. So microRNA, or uh, in short, it is called miRNA. So uh, as the name suggests, uh, you can uh, understand the, the size of these uh, RNA is very small. It's only 19 to 24 nucleotide long. These are highly conserved. Uh, these are obviously non-coding. They do not uh, code for any polypeptide, but they regulate gene expression at the post-transcription level. Either there are two mechanisms, either by site-specific cleavage or through the translational repression of the target mRNA. So that uh, I will explain later the mechanism of these two, uh, I mean, uh, mechanism of microRNA. And uh, usually, uh, apart from their role in wide uh, biological processes, microRNA, they play an essential role in regulating plant responses to different abiotic uh, stress. So lean 4 uh, this is the first described microRNA. And uh, in 1993, Rosalind Lee, she first identified this non-coding gene uh, in nematode, that is Synodeputis elegans. So in 1993, this was the first uh, described microRNA. And uh, uh, so uh, what are the small non-coding RNAs? NC means non-coding. So small non-coding RNA primarily comprises of microRNA, that is miRNA, or short interfering RNA or the siRNA. But both these uh, uh, types of RNA, they share the common homology. That means they have, uh, they, they, they uh, induce the gene silencing at a post-transcriptional level. And both are untranslated. That means they do not code for any polypeptide. So these are some of the features uh, that they share uh, that I have already mentioned. Only difference is microRNA. These are encoded by the uh, nuclear gene, whereas the short interfering RNA or siRNA, these are derived from the long double-stranded RNA transcript. So uh, I would like to uh, highlight uh, the biogenesis of the microRNA and the mode of action. Then I will highlight our work. So uh, as I mentioned, the microRNA, these are encoded by the nuclear gene and these gene may stand alone. Uh, that means it may be present uh, in between the two protein coding gene or it may be present within a protein coding gene. And uh, this basically uh, the scheme is based on the animal uh, system. So later I will uh, also highlight the uh, differences between the animal and plant uh, microRNA biogenesis methods. So uh, first, the microRNA gene is transcribed with the help of the RNA polymerase 2. Once it is transcribed, it forms a primary microRNA. And because of the sequence homology, it forms a secondary structure. This is basically a long microRNA. Uh, not, uh, this, that's why this is called the primary microRNA. It has a 5' prime cap and a 3' prime polyatyl. And uh, this primary microRNA is processed by a drosa and accessory proteins. This DROSA is basically a double-stranded RNA-specific endonuclease that creates a staggered cut at the base of the uh, this stem uh, loop structure, and that releases because of the staggered cut. It forms a two nucleotide three three prime overhang, and this primary micro micro microRNA is then processed into precursor microRNA. So pre microRNA once it is formed, it is uh, rapidly transported into the cytoplasm because all it happens within the nucleus. 
and their, their transportation is facilitated by the nuclear core and there is a one protein called the exporting 5 that basically helps in their export. This is basically the conversion of the primary to the pre microRNA with the help of ROSA. As I mentioned, ROSA, it causes a staggered cut. That's why here you can find two nucleotide overhang at the three prime end. So once the pre microRNA is within the cytoplasm, then dicer along with the accessory proteins that binds at the base of the loop. And again, this is a double stranded RNA specific endonuclease. They create cut at the base of the staggered cut at the base of this loop. So it finally forms a microRNA duplex. So this microRNA duplex comprises of one strand that is called the miRNA, that is the guide strand because it guides the miRNA complex to the target mRNA. And the another strand with, the, with this bulk that is with the imperfect pairing that is called the microRNA star strand or that is called the passenger strand. So now uh, another protein that is the AGO1 argonaut family protein that is basically a slicer with the accessory protein that comes and bind with this uh, microRNA duplex and it forms a pre myris complex. So this pre myris complex, the AGO1 basically clips this miRNA star strand so that from primary microRNA myris complex, it forms the mature myris complex that is microRNA induced silencing complex. Now this complex will go and bind to the target mRNA. So in case of animal, the bind system a binding site is mostly the three prime UTR region of the target mRNA. And that means the untranslated region of the three prime. So uh, uh, the, mostly the, prime, the binding at the three prime UTR region is basically imperfect binding. And this imperfect binding, it basically triggers the translation repression. So I will later uh, explain the different mechanism by which this, trans this repression happens. But in animal system, mostly the uh, microRNA mediated gene silencing is because of the translation inhibition. This is basically, as I mentioned, the processing of precursor to the RNA duplex with the help of the dicer enzyme. And these are our uh, work from, uh, these are some derived precursor structure. This is, you can find the blue one, this is basically miRNA star stand, and the red one, this is basically the mature mi risk, miRNA. Uh, that will eventually involved in the MRX complex. And one of the beauty of this system is that, as I mentioned, the three prime UTR region is basically has this uh, binding site for the microRNA that is present within the MRX. So uh, uh, within this three prime UTR region, the binding site, there may be a uh, binding site for more than one microRNA. That means a particular gene can be silenced by more than one microRNA because uh, uh, or alternatively, one can say a particular gene can silence more than one target. That means a particular gene can be silenced by more than one microRNA, more than microRNA because they have multiple binding site for multiple microRNA. Or alternatively, a single microRNA can silence more than one gene because of the presence of the complementary sequence in their target. So these are the five uh, mechanisms by which uh, the MIRIS complex, they basically trigger the translation repression. One is the bound MIRIS, uh, they basically compete for the cap binding site or it may compete for the elongation factor or it may compete for the 60s ribosome. It may trigger deadenylation or it may induce premature dropping of ribosome, it may induce decapping or deadenylation. So these are the five different uh, ways by which a microRNA present in the MIRIS complex, once it, bound, once it binds to the uh, target mRNA, uh, it uh, triggers the translation repression. So there are certain differences between the plant and animal microRNA biogenesis, as I mentioned. Uh, so, uh, in case of animal, the processing of precursor to the RNA duplex, uh, that will particularly the microRNA duplex, it happens within the cytoplasm and that is catalyzed with the uh, help of the uh, enzyme DROSA followed by the dicer. But in case of plant, it has been seen that microRNA duplex formation happens within the nucleus itself and there is no DROSA-like protein, so there are dicer-like proteins. So, this is called the DCL1, DCL2 like that. So that is another difference. And as I mentioned, in case of animals, mostly the binding of the you know, microRNA with the target is basically imperfect. Here you can find that there is a bulge. That means it's an imperfect binding and that leads to the translational inhibition. 
whereas in case of plants the binding of the microRNA to the target is mostly perfect so it induces the cleavage that means cleavage of the target mRNA either translation repression or the cleavage whatever the mechanism final product would be the silencing of the gene at a post transcriptional level because mRNA is synthesized but there would be no protein product either it would be cleaved or it would be no longer available for the translational repression so this is uh, 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 details uh, microRNA biogenesis in plant i am not going into details so usually a negative correlation does exist between the microRNA expression and their target uh, gene expression there are two different uh, ways by which uh, small rna confer tolerance against stress one is uh, a small rna uh, may be upregulated under certain stress condition and if their targets are negative regulators of the stress tolerance so upregulation of small rnas under the aortic stress it indicates the enhanced suppression of the negative reg uh, regulators so that basically uh, induces the stress tolerance or alternatively uh, suppose there are some microRNAs that they are their targets are positive regulator. So down regulation of the suppression of the, that particular small RNAs uh, would basically uh, I mean, it leads to the higher uh, abundance of the positive regulators. So that would in that way it would help the stress tolerance or it will impose the tolerance against that particular stress. So this is basically the role of me 398 during the abiotic stress. So under stress condition. Uh, the, it has been found that me 398 uh, there was a decrease in the expression. Now, uh, the target of me 398 is basically a copper zinc superoxide dismutase. There are two transcripts are basically their, their targets. One is the CSD1 and the CSD2. And we know that within a cell, uh, superoxide dismutase is act as a first, li first line of defense to scaffold the superoxide radical. So here, stress-induced downregulation of MIR398, basically it result in the higher accumulation of the CSD1 and the CSD2 transcript. That means, and subsequently the proteins, uh, uh, more amount of uh, enzymes would be produced. So that will give the protection uh, of the cell against the superoxide radical. So uh, in that particular, the stress-induced downregulation of MIR398, basically, it basically confers tolerance against the stress by uh, helping the upregulation of these or higher accumulation of these uh, CSD1 and CSD2. So this is another role of MIR160 and MIR167. Both that both these microRNA they have a target that is called the auxin response factor. And auxin response factor suppose under certain stress condition these microRNAs are upregulated. That leads to the uh, decreased uh, transcriptional abundance of these ARF and ARF these are basically a transcription factor that regulates the expression of auxin responsive gene so that means higher uh, increased uh, expression of MIR160 and 167 basically leads to the uh, decreased or restricted plant growth through down regulating of the ARF and uh, one thing I must say that whenever a plant experiences any form of stress plants always try to uh, restrict their plant growth. Uh, this is very much needed because plants always try to save their energy and that energy can be channelized to the defense purpose. So once uh, the stress is relieved, the plants will again regain its uh, normal growth. So uh, growth attenuation of the restricted plant growth is, is one of the defense strategies of plant to overcome the stress conditions. So here, basically, one six, upregulation of 160 and 167 basically it leads to the growth attenuation or the growth restricted plant growth under the stress condition. So now I would like to share uh, some of uh, our uh, results of our experiments. So uh, today I'm going to highlight the role or you can say the insight into the microRNA mediated response of maize plants towards arsenic stress that is a one heavy metal stress. I have selected a submargin stress that is a water stress. And lastly, I would like to highlight some recent work on metal oxide nanoparticle stress. So we all know that the arsenic contamination of groundwater has become a serious problem throughout the world, and particularly countries like our country, India, China, and Bangladesh. And uh, different factors, for example, withering, withering of rocks, minerals, and different anthropogenic activities that basically includes the indiscriminate release of pesticide, herbicide, and chemical uh, fertilizer. Uh, 
uh, uh, these are the main source of, or again, uh, soil irrigation with the contaminated ground, uh, ground water. These are the prime source of arsenic contamination. And in nature, arsenic prevails in two different forms. One is a uh, inorganic form that include arsenate and the arsenite, and there are some organic forms. Uh, so the picture showing the world map where different countries are highly uh, affected with the arsenic contamination and uh, in India also these are the different red color I have shown these these are the different state including the our one West Bengal, Bihar, Assam, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and Uttar Pradesh these are uh, highly affected with the arsenic and uh, most interestingly uh, that uh, we found that uh, in the, the literature says that groundwater of many blocks of uh, this uh, Nodia district or Murshidabad even the Bordhaman, Hooghly, uh, North and South Chobish these are contaminated with very high level of arsenic that is beyond the permissible level. And uh, the permissible level is 0.01 to 0.05 ppm. But report says that the, the groundwater or the drinking water basically contains more than 50 ppm of uh, arsenic in some areas of these districts. So uh, arsenic, uh, is basically enters the root system through the phosphate transporter. Once it is within the root cell, it is readily reduced into the more toxic arsenide form with the help of arsenic reductase in the presence of the glutathione. And arsenide itself, it enters the root system either through the silicon transporter or different aquaporins. So arsenic basically a uh, uh, phosphate analog. So it always compete for the phosphate uh, during the uptake by the root by the roots and uh, interestingly only arsenite uh, the, uh, these basically can react with the sulfohydryl group that is present uh, in the enzyme or different protein and that make them non-functional and in this way they basically disrupt the normal cellular function so uh, plant basically encounters this kind of heavy metal stress primarily through the phytochelatin mediated detoxification pathways and uh, arsenate has uh, no uh, affinity for the phytochelatin, the sulfhydryl group present in the uh, phytochelatin. Uh, we know that the phytochelatin is a very low molecular weight thiolpeptide that is basically involved in this chelation process. So only the arsenite uh, can uh, react with the phytochelatin or that make a complex or it may complex with a glutathione, reduced glutathione, and this complex gets sequestered within the vacuum with the help of the transporter, that is the ATP binding casket or the ABC transporter. So plants may be a hypoaccumulator of the arsenic or it may be hyperaccumulator. So these are the two very common plants. Uh, we all know that's the Teres vitata, and this is a Brassica juncia. These two plants, they have developed a very unique features to accumulate very high amount of arsenic within the tissue and they exhibit very high root to shoot uh, translocation. So this is from a uh, picture that is taken from one of our recent review papers. Uh, so this is uh, this represent the regulatory networks of the heavy metal stress responsive microRNAs and their targets. What I want to say that uh, you can find that each and every step by which a plant basically mitigate the heavy metal stress is controlled by a microRNA. Here you can find this is one a transporter protein through which the heavy metals enter get entered within the root cell. So uh, that also has a, a target of a specific microRNA. That means MIR167, its target is this uh, transporter protein. Similarly, as I mentioned that phytochelatin makes a complex with the heavy metal ions then get sequestered within the uh, vacuole through the ABC transporter. So ABC transporter is also a target of these microRNA. So each and every step uh, that are uh, involved in, uh, I mean, uh, in uh, that gives tolerance against the uh, stress condition. These are regulated by various microRNAs. So we have been working on maize, that is basically the queen of cereals, and uh, in India, uh, it is the third most uh, important cereal crop after the rice and wheat, and it contributes around nine percent in the national food basket. So the this is basically a table showing. Uh, differentially expressed uh, microRNAs under some common micro, common metal uh, stress. So for example, this particular uh, microRNA family that is MIR319 uh, found to be expressed under cadmium or aluminium or manganese or like this stress and th their target is mainly transcription factor, TCP. So this is one uh, table that uh, shows that 
there are certain uh, microRNA families which are conserved throughout the different plant uh, species and they are commonly expressed under different stress condition. So first experiment was all about the modulation of microRNA expression profile in maize leaf under arsenic stress. So we did this experiment with the objective that is first one was the assessment of the arsenic stress uh, on maize settling and second one was to deep sequencing or you can say the NGS of uh, small RNAs for identification and the characterization of arsenic responsive microRNAs for better understanding the underlying molecular mechanism of arsenic stress in maize. So this is experimental design. I'm not going into details, but there are one control group plants were there and there was arsenate stress plants. So we imposed 50 micromolar arsenate stress. And uh, after two days of stress, we isolated RNA from the leaves uh, for the downstream work of uh, for the smaller library preparation and the deep sequencing. So uh, uh, during the pilot experiment, we found that after two days of arsenate stress, there is a significant reduction in the shoot biomass and also very clear symptoms of uh, high accumulation of reactive oxygen species within the tissues were observed. That, were, that was the reason we selected the second day uh, for the experiment. So this is the step. Uh, these are the steps of microRNA profiling, starting from the RNA isolation, then small RNA library preparation, deep sequencing, bioinformatic analysis. You think this is basically a free software that is a UEA small RNA workbench we are using, and this is followed by the validation. So the, this is basically the overview of the small RNA library preparation from the plant sample, starting from the total RNA isolation, following the trisol method, and then uh, the RNA was quantified using the nanodrop. Then the quality was checked with the help of bioanalyzer, uh, just to check the ring value, that is the RNA integrity number, and this ring value uh, between the seven and 10 are basically acceptable range. So once it passed the quality, then uh, small RNA library preparation was done. This is followed by the uh, deep sequencing and the bioinformatics analysis. So these are the different steps or you can, the different tools that we are using. One is for the identification and, uh, and expression profiling of the known and novel microRNAs using the MIR prof software followed and the MIRCAT software. And then uh, prediction of plant microRNA of target gene was done using the TS RNA target analysis software and Blast2Go software was used for the description of the biological process, molecular function, and cellular components. So this is uh, adapter removal. This is basically one of the helper tools uh, already installed in the UAE small RNA workbench that we are using. That's basically free software. And that was uh, used to uh, for trimming of the uh, adapt this is basically trimming of the adapters from the small RNA sequences. Uh, this is a filter uh, tool that is used to discard the known tRNA, rRNA, or the low complexity reads. This is a MIRPROF software that was used for identification and expression profiling of known microRNA. This is the MIR database. Uh, it's called MIR base or MIR database. And these are the different uh, tools that are uh, freely available uh, in the web uh, site. And uh, these are for the plant microRNA analysis. It includes TAPIR, it includes uh, the MIR tool or it includes MIR base or MIR plant. These are the av freely available software that can be used for detection of the plant microRNA and to uh, identify their targets. So all these are freely available. So MIRCAT, uh, that is again a tool uh, that is installed within the UAE and that was used for the identification of novel microRNAs and the corresponding precursor uh, microRNA structure and this is PSTRNA uh, software that was used for the prediction of the microRNA target genes in the plant and that's the uh, just a glimpse of Blast2Go uh, used for the gene ontology study. So uh, this is all about our result so this is uh, the figure showing the size distribution of the unique small RNA sequences in both the libraries that is control and the stress one. Uh, 24 nucleotide sequence was found to be the most abundant, followed by the 22 and 21 nucleotide sequence. This is the statistics of the small RNA sequences. I'm not going into details. Uh, this is the abundance of the known microRNA families in our data set. For both the libraries, MIR 166 was found to be the uh, most abundant. It has the highest number of members uh, in both the libraries. So under uh, the arsenic stress, uh, we have found a large number of microRNAs were differentiated. They, uh, 
regulated. And in our case, we found 16 uh, up-regulated and 33 down-regulated uh, microRNA under the arsenate stress condition. And among them, MIR 8175 and the MIR 166 E3P, these two microRNA, they exhibit maximum up-regulation and maximum down-regulation uh, in our data set. So the, this is basically our predicted targets of the conserved microRNAs. You can find here the particular microRNA is MIR 156S. It has all these predicted targets and their uh, putative functions are there. Mostly the, uh, the targets are transcriptional factors. And uh, this is the mode of uh, inhibition. As I mentioned, the, there are two mechanisms by which a microRNA usually uh, suppress their gene expression. One is cleavage, another one a translation repression. So here it is cleavage. So you can find all these targets are being uh, silenced by a single microRNA. That is the beauty of the system, as I mentioned, because all these targets, they have the complementary sequence against the meat 156s So this is the gene ontology study, uh, the table showing uh, the microRNA, their target genes, their target description. This is geocellular component, that is nucleus here, this is a DNA binding function, and like this. Uh, again, a graph showing the geo category, geo ontology study. So this is all about the validation of the uh, microRNA, uh, the result that we uh, got from the after deep sequencing and doing the bioinformatics. Uh, so stem loop QRT PCR was done to validate the selected microRNAs, or you can say the candidate microRNAs. So here you can find this is basically a comparative photograph. Both stem loop QRT PCR and the deep sequencing they shows the similar down regulation. So that is one kind of you can say validation of your deep sequencing data with the stem loop QRT PCR. This is the target. I mean uh, gene expression study of the, the target of those microRNAs. So uh, the the arsenate responsive microRNAs were found to be associated with diverse biological processes, uh, including the plant growth and development. That includes MIR 156S, MIR 166E3P. All these are the different microRNAs which are involved in this particular biological process. Some are involved in metabolic process. Some are uh, responsible for the ROS generation. Some are involved in the hormonal signaling, and some are involved in microRNA biogenesis. So, based on our uh, obtained data, we basically propose this model to explain the arsenic stress responses in plant. So severe oxidative burst you can find as evident with the histochemical staining. That might be a consequence of the down regulation of MIR-167D because MIR-167D, it has a target of phospholipase alpha-1. And you can find that, as I mentioned, once the microRNA is down regulated, it basically allows the higher uh, accumulation of this particular transcript. So uh, PLD alpha-1, uh, their higher accumulation or the higher abundance of this particular uh, target is basically responsible for the oxidative burst because uh, phospholipase D alpha 1 is basically involved in the production of the reactive oxygen species. Similarly, the down regulation of AR3, uh, ARF3, that is oxygen uh, response factor, again a transcription factor, and the GMYB, again a trans transcription factor, these are basically responsible for the restricted plant growth. So, as I mentioned, this is basically one of the different strategies by which a plant can withstand the stress. So uh, since the GMYB, it has a it's, it is target of MIR 319B3P. So down regulation of this particular microRNA basically a pre prerequisite for inducing that restricted growth. As I mentioned, usually a negative correlation does exist between a microRNA and the target. But here you can find we didn't find uh, that kind of relation in particular 167D and uh, ARF3 because uh, as I mentioned, a particular microRNA has more than one target. So this particular microRNA, it has two targets, PLD alpha 1 and ARF3 1, F3. So, uh, but here uh, it is downregulated, uh, but still we found that ARF3, it was also downregulated. So uh, there was no such type of negative correlation exist here. Uh, but in case of aradiosis, some, some TASI element, that means the uh, transacting siRNAs are involved in down regulation of ER, ERF3 uh, and ERF6 and ERF9. So we also propose their involvement of maybe some such kind of TASI and that uh, needs further investigation. Some TASI may be involved in the down regulation of ER, ERF3. Uh, 
So we uh, published this our data in 2017. So while comparing our data with other published data, we uh, presented uh, the picture for our review work. So this is uh, basically the uh, heavy metal response in microRNAs and their targets and their involvement in different uh, biological processes. Even you can find the uh, heavy metal response in microRNAs. Those are also involved in different uh, physiological function, flower development, leaf development, and all these things, including the heavy metal stress uh, responses. So these are basically uh, uh, you can find the differentially expressed microRNAs under various heavy metal stress. So these are the numerous microRNAs which are commonly expressed, maybe commonly expressed, or it may be a uh, so it may be a stress specific expression. So these microRNAs and their uh, targets and uh, their uh, their, their involved, I mean, association with the different biological processes. So and the, which are basically involved in the plant adaptation and the tolerance against these kind of uh, stresses. So the, the table showing uh, the, uh, I mean, the expression of particular microRNA family, for example, here, mid 156 family members were found to be expressed under these different heavy metal stress under these plant uh, species. So these are basically the conserved microRNAs, which are commonly expressed in diverse uh, plant species under different uh, heavy metal stress. So this is a uh, again, a similar picture, but here we've uh, mentioned the up and down regulation of specific microRNA in different plant species under different uh, heavy metal stress. So now come to the second stress, uh, that is the submergent stress. Uh, this particular crop, uh, that is maize, is very much sensitive to uh, both forms of water stress, that is both scarcity of the water, that is drought, and also the presence of excess amount of water, that is the flood. So flood basically affect maize growth and yield uh, to some degree at almost all growth stages. However, the plant is more susceptible at a seedling stage. Now, uh, oxygen limitation uh, due to this flooding is basically uh, cause a metabolic shift from the aerobic respiration to the less efficient anaerobic fermentation. So this is our experimental uh, flow chart you can find. So we uh, imposed uh, complete submarginal stress. Uh, it's a on the three days old uh, maize seedlings and the submergent stress was all about for four days. So you can find after four days of complete submergence, here is the experimental uh, prototype. So here uh, you can find that after four days of stress, there is complete reduction in the uh, shoot growth and also, also the root growth. Uh, that means that there is a complete restriction of the plant growth under the stress condition. So uh, uh, one of the early responses of plant uh, towards the flooding stress is down regulation of photosynthetic activity. And uh, as a result, the photosynthetic electron transport chain get over reduced and uh, it, that leads to the formation of different reactive oxygen species. So that, that was visualized with the help of the histochemical staining as well as the uh, this DCFD and DHA staining. So you can find that uh, these are the uh, indicative of the H2O2 accumulation within the, this is basically a cross section of the root, maize root, and this is NBT and DAP staining. We also done the QRT-PCR of gene expression study of these antioxidant gene, and we found out of these five antioxidant genes of the ascorbate glutathione cycle, two genes, particularly the APX1 and the copper zinc SODs were significantly down-regulated and uh, since APX1, the primary function of the APX is to scavenge the uh, hydroxy H2O2 uh, from the system and also the copper zinc SOD is basically the scavengers of the superoxide radical. So we propose that uh, this, this, this submerges induced uh, down regulation of APX1 and the copper zinc SOD. These two are basically responsible for the higher accumulation of the hydrogen peroxide that was evident uh, through the DAP staining and also through the, through the DCFDA staining and also this uh, down regulation of copper zinc SOD that leads to the higher accumulation of, uh, or you can say the less scavenging of the superoxide radical that was again evident from the NBT staining and with the DHT staining. So we also measure, measured the superoxide anion formation within the tissue and you can find there's a very um, significant increase in the superoxide anion level in the submerged uh, tissue 
and uh, there is a, a high amount of MD also indicates uh, the lipid peroxidation on the membrane damage under the flood condition. And we also measured the PDC and the ADA. These are the pyruvate decarboxylase and the alcohol dehydrogenase. These are the two enzymes that are responsible for the formation of the ethanol from the pyruvate. So this is basically a fermentation pathway. So uh, in a higher increase in the abundance of the PDC and ADH, these basically uh, indicate the metabolic shift from the aerobic respiration to the less efficient anaerobic respiration. So uh, this is basically a size distribution of unique small RNA sequences. Uh, just like uh, the, our previous work, we found that both uh, in the both libraries, the 24 nucleotide unique sequence was found to be the most abundant, followed by the 23 and the 22 nucleotide. And this is the Venn diagram showing the distribution of the known microRNA among the control and the, the submerged root. Uh, you can find this is 109 microRNAs are exclusively expressed under control condition. These are exclusively expressed in uh, submerged group, and uh, these are among the 188 commonly expressed. These are basically the commonly expressed microRNAs in between uh, that, that is commonly expressed in both the group, that is the control group as well as in the submerged group. This is an overview of the small RNA sequences. I'm not going into details. Uh, this is again a microRNA family. This is a higher. Uh, highest abundance. Here also we found MIR-166 has the highest uh, members uh, within the family. These are some derived precursor structures. So under the uh, submergent stress, most of the microRNAs, commonly expressed microRNAs, were found to be found regulated. So out of the 45 differentially expressed microRNAs, we found that 43 were down regulated and, and only two were up regulated. So uh, this indicates that uh, this uh, short term, uh, however, that is a complete submergent stress is good enough to alter a large number of microRNAs. So these are the predicted targets, geontology study. Uh, this is again a geo study uh, figures. So the submergent responsive microRNAs were found to be associated with diverse uh, biological processes that includes plant growth regulator, plant growth and development, then hormone signaling, then chromatin remodeling, protein transport, then microRNA biogenesis, and the redox homeostasis. So this is basically uh, QRT-PCR uh, analysis, uh, just to validate uh, the microRNA data and the target. So here you find this is the MIR-160F5P. It has a target of ARF8. So uh, this is QRT-PCR analysis. There is a significant down regulation of these. This is basically a stem to QRT-PCR data. So there is a significant down regulation of this expression of this particular microRNA. And uh, here, in contrast, the ARF8 uh, transcriptional abundance was found. So negative correlation between the microRNA and its target, you can find there is a down regulation of microRNA and there is an up regulation of uh, their corresponding target. So similarly, 172A was found to be down regulated and its target, ERAP uh, 2.7, was found to be up regulated. So this is again uh, uh, summarizing our uh, differentially expressed microRNA, their targets, and their association in various metabolic processes involved in plant responses to submergent stress. So uh, um, this is a proposed model. So what we uh, found that uh, MIR-172A is basically this mediated upregulation of RAP 2.7, which is basically a uh, transcription factor. Uh, that basically uh, is, is a prerequisite for the metabolic shift from the aerobic respiration to the anaerobic respiration. And uh, because uh, this RAP 2.7, it basically triggers the expression of the anaerobic gene that we have already studied with the QRT, that there is a significant but higher abundance of the transcriptional abundance of this ADH and the PDC. So down regulation of 172 basically uh, it, it basically responsible for, uh, or you can see this basically a prerequisite factor for this shifting from the aerobic respiration to the anaerobic respiration. And uh, the oxidative burst, as, as we have seen through our histochemical staining and other staining procedure, that might be due to the down regulation of these MIR-164, MIR-16 family uh, microRNAs, because their target is uh, first uh, this uh, peroxidase. 
and that was also confirmed with the uh, western blotting that significant down regulation was observed and uh, this peroxidase down regulation of peroxidase basically might be responsible for higher accumulation of uh, this h2o2 within the tissue and that may lead to the uh, oxidative stress damages and lastly i would like to uh, share some uh, results of our recent findings that is all about the microRNA expression profiling of uh, this is a heavy metal or you can say the metal based nan nanoparticles we used uh, znoonp that is the zinc oxide nanoparticles so nanoparticles is basically a very a new class of environmental pollutants and by definition these are basically ultra fine particles that typically have one dimension that is less than 100 nanometer in size so uh, the rapid uh, development in the nanotechnology and nano industry uh, but they are uh, unsystematic uh, discharge of these nano containing biosolids and these agrochemicals into the environment is basically a, uh, it's, it, it poses a serious threat to the ecological receptors including the plants so nanoparticle basically enters the uh, root system through apoplastic pathway and their impact or their effect primarily depends on the size, concentration, and the stability of the nanoparticles. So, like other heavy metals, uh, the ZNO, uh, ZNO NP uh, that was found to be uh, also exert uh, the oxidative stress, and that basically triggers this oxidative stress through enhanced production of the reactive oxygen species. That's, that also triggers or disrupt the redox homeostasis. It also leads to the higher lipid peroxidation and membrane damage. So uh, uh, we also found that ZNO-NP, uh, we actually uh, impose the, uh, this particular stress, uh, 800 ppm of ZNO-NP on maize seedling. And we also found after doing the histochemical staining, uh, we also found that the, 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 the ZNO-NP uh, is uh, good enough to impose uh, uh, oxidative stress and that was revealed after the histochemical staining as you can find the blue spots are and the brown spot these are the indicatives of the superoxide radical accumulation and the h2o2 accumulation within the tissue this is a, a histochemical detection of zinc within the tissue because we are using zno np as a uh, as a stressor so uh, in case of stress plant uh, what we have found that uh, we also did the uh, atomic absorption spectrophotometric study of uh, tissue accumulation of zinc and we found that as compared to the control there is a much higher accumulation of the zinc within the tissue and this particular uh, histochemical staining technique was done to locate the location of the zinc accumulation within the tissue you can find is the root tip here you can find the blue coloration is basically indicative of zinc accumulation and this is the cross section of the polyoptide here you can find this is the control polyoptide here there is no such blue coloration but here this is the stressed uh, you can say the cross section of the polyoptile. Here you can find all these blue spots. These are all indicative of the high zinc accumulation within the tissue. So this is basically a, a scanning electron micrograph of root tip. Here you can find control root tip, and this is a ZNO NP uh, stressed uh, root tips. Here you can find these are the adsorption of the uh, ZNO NP nanoparticles on the root tips. And this is the uh, enlarged microscopic view. You can find these are the uh, structures of uh, nanoparticles that uh, got adhered on the root uh, tip or the upper layer of the root tip. And we also did the EDEX uh, spectrum analysis uh, just to uh, reveal the elemental analysis on, on the root. And we found that these structures you can find here, you can find this is zinc. It's, it's it's good enough so that also indicates that these are the basically the uh, zeno np nanoparticles that got adhered on the root tips and uh, we also found a large number of microRNAs uh, differentially regulated under the zeno np stress two were found to be up regulated and 73 were found to be down regulated so these are the different uh, biological processes that were uh, controlled by the nanoparticle induced or responsive microRNAs that includes both plant growth development, hormone signaling, raw homeostasis, heavy metal transport, photosynthesis, etc. So this is again a validation of the microRNA expression and the target validation. You can find a negative correlation uh, does exist between the microRNA and the target. 
So this is a proposed hypothetical model which explain the response of maize seedling towards uh, ZNONP stress. So here you can find the scare crew six. This was uh, has been found to be the target of MIR 171B. So uh, down regulation of this particular microRNA that leads to the higher accumulation of scare crew six. And scare crew six is responsible for the inhibition of the chlorophyll biosynthesis through inactivating inactivating these particular enzyme. And similarly, MIR 166 uh, I basically. Uh, it's a down regulated under this particular stress and that leads to higher accumulation of polyamine oxidase 3 that leads to the program cell death through the higher accumulation of the h2o2 or by inducing the oxidative burst so this is again a defense strategy and uh, there are two more strategies that uh, we found that one is mir triple four a its target is abc transporter and uh, the down regulation uh, of me triple four a under the z stress that leads to the higher accumulation of the abc transporter uh, transcriptor abundance and uh, we know that uh, i have mentioned in one uh, slide that abc transporter is basically responsible for the sequestration of the mic uh, of this uh, phytochelatin and the heavy metal ions into the vacuum so higher uh, abundance of this particular transporter protein basically uh, gives more sequestration of the heavy metal plants within the vacuum. So this is one of the different strategies of the plant uh, to adapt the general NP stress. Uh, this is uh, another uh, microRNA that is mir 156 b one It's again found to be down-regulated and its uh, I mean, target is up-regulated, that is the callose synthase. This particular enzyme basically is responsible for the formation of the callose. And callose deposition in plasma membrane and the cell wall basically restrict the uptake and the mobilization of the heavy metals through the tissue. So uh, excess amount of callose synthase uh, production or you can say the abundance of these indicates uh, the better, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's one of the different strategies of the uh, maize plant uh, to withstand this kind of stress. So we published this data very recently in last year uh, in Chemosphere. So, uh, so, so our studies uh, reveal large number of uh, differentially expressed microRNAs. Uh, we identified the target, or you can say the uh, candid microRNAs and their targets. But what next? So there are two more approaches that uh, are being used nowadays uh, to develop, uh, I mean, a genetically engineered crop that can withstand the stress or which shows better uh, improvement in uh, crop or any other economical. Uh, characters. So one approach is artificial microRNA or that is called the miRNA, AMIRNA and another one is artificial target mimic that is also known as target mimicry. So uh, I mentioned there are two mechanisms by which a microRNA basically it degrades its or you can say it blocks the transla I mean, tra translation. One is translational inhibition, another one it just bind with the uh, target mRNA and it clips that. So in either of these case, there would be no protein product. But suppose if a protein product or a target is, is a positive regulator of a stress, uh, or the, the stress tolerance or the, that gives a uh, I mean, good economic character. So in that case, if we can silence a particular microRNA, uh, which basically degrade that mRNA, in, the, in doing so, we, we can introduce uh, this artificial target mimics or you can say it's, it's, it's a basically a nucleotide sequence which is very similar to the target but it, it, it carries some bulges or mismatch that basically prevent microRNA mediated cleavage. That means once you introduce uh, artificial target within the cell that particular microRNA will go and bind to that uh, artificial target and so that the original target uh, remains uh, saved and that can be translated and that will give protection or that will uh, give the promising result. So this is one way by which we can, uh, you can silence uh, or you can uh, divert the action of the microRNA. So uh, this happens, uh, one can do this uh, when the target of that particular microRNA is basically a positive regulator of a, uh, particularly the, uh, I mean, the positive regulator of the, uh, you can say, uh, the stress tolerance or one can introduce a artificial microRNA. Suppose a particular uh, target is basically a negative regulator of the uh, stress tolerance. In that case, 
once you uh, add artificial microRNA, so there would be a higher abundance of these microRNAs, so there would be more cleavage of the target mRNA, so negative regulators can be relieved uh, so that it will, in this way, plant can impose uh, tolerance. So uh, this is uh, again a picture of target mimicry. I'm not going into detail. This is a very interesting uh, study that uh, using a target mimicry, uh, you can confuse a particular microRNA. Uh, it all happens with in case of aerodopsis with a reduced phosphate content. Uh, so these are the examples of manipulation of different microRNA expression profile and their target. So you can find in case of aerodopsis, the MIR 169, it has these targets. So what expression of these target was found to be imposed or it induces drought tolerance in case of aerodopsis. So these are some classic examples by which one can uh, manipulate the microRNA on its target and uh, that may give tolerance against the respective stress. These are some of the success stories. Uh, transgenic aerodopsis was developed over expression uh, these nuclear factors and uh, that was basically target of MIR-169 and that uh, basically lead to the enhanced drought tolerance. And these are some other examples you can find. So uh, this is uh, all about our study and this is my lab. Uh, these are my uh, scholars, some have already done their PhD. So they are basically uh, the pillars of my success. So if you are interested, you can uh, visit our lab. And uh, lastly, I would like to acknowledge all uh, the national and international funding agencies for supporting our research. And thank you. So if you have any uh, query you can ask, I'm ready to, uh, I will try to give my answer. So if you have any query, you can ask. Okay, thank you very much, sir, for uh, your outstanding speech. Now, we have an open session of interaction. If anyone has any query, please ask uh, and place your query in front of sir. And if you have any doubt, uh, in uh, any time you, uh, you can visit our lab and uh, we will try to uh, give you an answer. Uh, and uh, this is basically an emerging area that uh, microRNAs, uh, they are playing roles in uh, conferring different stress as well as different, uh, I would say, uh, they are involved in different physiological processes. So we are uh, particularly interested on abiotic stress. That's why we are doing these kind of studies. Uh, there are several studies are going on uh, throughout the world. And uh, so, Right now, if you have any query, you can ask. I'm here. Okay, I think uh, uh, Mr. Shuman Karmakar wants to ask something uh, yes, for uh, to uh, please uh, place your question. To start. Okay, sir. Uh, yeah. One uh, related question, not directly to the stress biology, yeah. sir. How can we mitigate? Uh, arsenic contamination in economically important plants that we actually eat regularly, uh, like the rice plants, mustard plants, is there any... Uh, mitigation, mitigation process? Yes. Okay, in case of uh, mitigation, that means in a field level, there are certain studies have been done. Uh, since I have mentioned that uh, arsenic is basically a phosphate analog, so there are certain experiments have been done who are using phosphate uh, fertilizer they are adding phosphate fertilizer in the soil so that the arsenate, arsenic form what is present in the soil, they compete for that phosphate to enter the root system because the entry of uh, phosphate as well as the arsenate or the, uh, it's in the similar, in the, through the similar transporter. So uh, it's one kind of, you can say, adding the phosphate fertilizer in the soil that gives a uh, uh, I mean, competition between the arsenic and the phosphate so uh, it has been found adding phosphate although the, I, I don't I don't think that would be very much I mean, economically viable okay. uh, and also uh, but that is uh, you can you can do this and uh, what we did in our uh, lab experiment uh, we basically add uh, the precursor of the phytochelating synthesis because these are synthesized from the reduced glutathione so we added uh, 
uh, additionally, uh, I mean, uh, in the media, we add uh, excess of uh, reduced glutathione. And we found that there is more uh, phytochelin synthesis and that gives much, much better protection. So in lab condition, that's a different way, but it is not feasible to add glutathione in the soil. So one of the possible feasible uh, way is to add uh, phosphate, uh, phosphate containing uh, fertilizer in the field. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, okay, go uh, ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, myself, uh, Choudhury Habibu Rahman from uh, Botany Department, Vishto So okay. thank you very much, uh, Professor Hussain, for yes. your nice and excellent uh, talk. One query is there with me. So that is that, uh, what is the uh, relationship between the stress condition and the synthesis of the calories? Sorry, uh, stress condition and I couldn't hear. And synthesis of the calories. Calories, okay, okay. That's a very good, good, good question. So, uh, actually, calories. Uh, I, uh, I, I just want to go to that particular side, slide. Okay, just one minute. That's a very good question, and uh, I, I'm trying to give my answer. But still, I would request you go through our paper so that you will get much more information. Here, it may be this slide. No, yes. So, you find. So me 156 b one its target is callose synthase. That means this particular microRNA, it shows homology with the transcript of callose synthase. So down regulation of me 156 b it basically, there is a down regulation under this particular stress. So it basically, down regulation basically ensures the higher abundance of the callosynthase. synthase. Now, callosynthase synthase is this particular enzyme is respons responsible for the formation of the callose. And this callose deposition in the cell membrane and the cell wall is a different strategy because it prevents the uptake and the localization or you can say the transportation of the uh, heavy metals through the plant tissue. So deposition of callose is one of the different strategies of the plant. So in this way, we correlate with the down regulation of near 156 and the plant adaptation because uh, although uh, we didn't measure the callose level or like that, but since callose synthesis is responsible for the callose formation and callose is basically uh, deposited in plasma membrane and uh, that uh, that's where we uh, propose that it might be uh, related. This down regulation is basically uh, might be related with the uh, higher uh, synthesis of callose because it permits the ca callose synthesis uh, so that in this way it gives protection. So in this relation, uh, one uh, again query is there. That, yes. uh, usually what happens actually in the flame tissue uh, studies, flame. Mm -hmm. So what happens actually in uh, flame tissue, uh, so many experiments uh, have been done regarding the wound stress wound, by cutting simply when yes the, yes yes uh, yes yes that that wound how that wound is actually acting as a stress okay wound, wound stress is again a stress again again a wound stress again as one form of stress and uh, there are some, there are some works that have been done on wound stress and here I would like to share one thing, as you, as you have told, that there are certain microRNAs that have been found to travel through this phloem. So those are called mobile microRNA. And there are only few papers are there which work on the uh, mobile microRNA. So that is again another area of research. And we also uh, attempted that, but it was very difficult to collect phloem fluid enough in enough quantity because we have to isolate RNA from that phloem and then we have to do these microRNA profiling study. But uh, you can find there are two or three papers which are working on I mean, uh, the mobile microRNA. It's a very interesting one, uh, particularly yeah, in the yeah. drought case. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is my last query to you, Professor Hussain. That is that. Uh, you just uh, studied the uh, uh, chemical localization, histochemical studies and all these things. Oh. And in, in a maize coleoptile uh, seedling, I think, uh, 
uh, the localization of uh, zinc. zinc oxide, I think. Zinc oxide NP. Am I right? So it, it the basically indicates the zinc, the localization yeah. of zinc. Yes. So, uh, is there any tissue specification in localization of zinc? That we didn't study, but uh, because uh, we uh, used a zinc specific dye that is called zincon. So we found one paper in PLOS one. Uh, they are they use this uh, kind of study, and uh, we use zincon for a uh, in our case, and we found this type of same blue coloration. And uh, our objective was to support the uh, the atomic absorption data because atomic absorption data also revealed that under the this stress, the tissue accumulates high amount of zinc. So in that. No, no, no. I'm sorry, sorry, I am interrupting you. Yes. Sorry for interruption. The mm -hmm. thing is like that. My my query is not like this. Okay. Is, is it uh, very much tissue specific when the uh, zinc oxide it enters into the tissue through apoplastic pathway and yes. then it in, accumulate in the cortical zone or the parenchymata specific zone or the phloem tissue or it is adhere with my yes, my yes. my query is on that point yes yes uh, actually the what happened the in case of uh, zeno np nanoparticles only few works have been done on these aspects and uh, uh, regarding your query uh, basically uh, tem is required that is the transmission electron microscopy uh, is required for uh, locating their movement and their uh, you can say that your tissue uh, specific accumulation so uh, we didn't have that uh, facility of team, but we tried that, but we couldn't uh, go for that one. But uh, you can find one or two papers uh, who are working on copper zinc SOD and uh, so, sorry, copper zinc, uh, copper oxide nanoparticles, uh, mm -hmm. where they found that uh, they are very, they are very much specific to the epidermis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor you. Shen. Your nice uh, explanation. Your you were you did a very good work on the stress biology, specifically the <coughs> micro uh, RNA study and all these things. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, uh, sir. We have some questions from our uh, participants. Uh, Sheeta Devi Sharma has asked that how does over flooding causes anaerobic condition for plants? Okay, uh, so once uh, the root or the plants are completely submerged, so there would be no oxygen. Uh, I mean, you can say there would be a deep deprivation of the oxygen in the water level. So finally, that uh, reduction in the oxygen level in the surrounding, uh, you can say, the water. So there is a basically a metabolic shift happens because there is no enough oxygen to carry on the Krebs cycle. So that's the reason once plant is uh, get uh, flooded or remains uh, suspended uh, with either completely or incompletely, once the root system is submerged within the uh, water, so there is uh, less water permeability, I mean, so oxygen permeability through the soil. So that leads to the conversion of the metabolic or you can say the metabolic shift happens uh, from the aerobic respiration to the anaerobic respiration because there is a limitation of oxygen in the you can say soil as well as uh, if the whole plant is uh, get uh, i mean uh, i mean submerged then uh, again there is less i mean uh, circulation of the oxygen okay sir her second question is can this abiotic stress caused by these nanoparticles uh, and can be reduced by phytoremediation? Uh, the, that can, uh, the, the study can be done, but uh, I don't think uh, that uh, that's interesting question, but <laughs> uh, we didn't uh, do that because mostly the phytoremediation is done for heavy metal stress. And uh, actually what happened, we uh, studied that up to eight, uh, we, we did a uh, lot of, uh, I mean, pilot experiment before doing this. 
and we found that uh, if you lower the concentration of the zeno NP, so there is no such kind of toxicity. We found that uh, concentration beyond 800 ppm is toxic for the plant. So uh, there is uh, at present there is uh, there is there should not be much worry about how we uh, mitigate these kind of stress with uh, phytoremediation. What we we have to think that how to control or how to control the discharge of these uh, biosolid I mean, the nanoparticle containing part, I mean material from the industry. That 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 uh, I mean care should be taken. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, we have actually a lot of questions. <laughs> Our student Afrina has asked how improved varieties of plants respond to abiotic stress. Actually, it depends how the, the, you have developed that particular variety of that plant. If uh, suppose if this is uh, a particular suppose uh, uh, I mean say if you develop a genetically engineered plant uh, that is uh, I mean tolerant against a drought uh, condition. That plant will not withstand uh, water, uh, I mean, flooding condition or uh, salinity. So, if you design a crop, so you you design your crop based on the your target. Uh, I mean, in our case, in, in it may be a target mRNA or the target, uh, I mean, microRNA. But uh, there are uh, some conventional ways of breeding are there also. Uh, by crossing uh, different elite varieties, you can develop and you can screen, even you can screen from the existing varieties uh, that uh, you can find that there are certain, particularly the wild plants, uh, those are basically uh, much taller, that exact, uh, I mean, it exhibits much tolerance against the stress as compared to the high yielding variety. So screening can be done and uh, you can find that particular crop, maybe uh, you can screen against a particular stress. You can impose. A, suppose you, you uh, suppose you screen a hundred of uh, existing variety. You impose a drought stress. Then you can find what are the numbers of uh, I mean varieties which can withstand. Some would be very much uh, I mean sensitive. Some would be moderate uh, tolerant. Some would show tolerant. So in this way, you can screen certain uh, varieties from the existing variety also. And you can release that variety after doing all the formalities. So that 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 can be done. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, I have um, uh, to say to the audience that if you have any question, you can uh, ask sir. <laughs> As yes, sir yes. have um, a lot of questions and he is answering all our questions. Yes, uh, no problem. In future, also you can contact me or you can visit our lab. You can go to our website also, not uh, our website. You can go through the research gate and all this. You can find our publications. You can go through that. And if you have query in that case, I'm here to give you answer. So yeah, uh, Dr. Hussain. Yes. I have a question. Myself, uh, Shomu Mukherjee from Botan Department. Okay. Yes, yes. So thank you, Dr. Hussain, for such a nice and comprehensive presentation. Yes, so yes. I would just like to know regarding the MIRNA. So, do they exhibit any long distance signaling? Like, are they only spatially compartmentalized in the tissues, or do they have some root shoot communications? No, that, that that I have that I have mentioned that there okay. are certain microRNA. Some only few works have been done on okay. the mobile microRNA. Okay. So, uh, those microRNAs, those are since uh, why it is called mobile because they can uh, they can be transported through the phloem tissue okay. phloem fluid. So, uh, but we also tried that. But as I mentioned, very difficult to get huge amount of fluid tissue. I mean, fluid and to extract the RNA. So uh, that is one is aspect that uh, these are uh, that that basically induce a long distance uh, signaling method. So, so are there any reports for uh, modulation of nitric oxide biosynthesis or hydrogen sulfide? Like these gaseous biomolecules, they are being worked out these days. So, are there any reports that microRNA also modulates the gener generation of these gaseous biomolecules in some way? Oh, I didn't find, but uh, okay. we can start. Yeah, because this is a very uh, potential area these days. Yes, yes, yes. There are a lot of areas in, uh, uh, I mean, uh, within our uh, state, there are uh, diverse areas. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir. We have one last question. Uh, asked by Ancona Me Baltazar. 
she is asking that uh, do you have any observation uh, uh, other than uh, the crop plants uh, is there any specific plant action which exhibit the same stress response sorry i, ca I can't hear uh, so what was uh, the question the question is uh, is there any other plant species other than uh, crop plants which exhibit the same stress response Apart uh, from the crop plants, is there any other plant like I, uh, any kind of uh, other economically important plants? Yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, reports are there. You can go through those papers. But what we found that in our case, we compared the, our data because we have been working on mainly on maize. But we also parallelly we did uh, this uh, nanoparticle stress on rice also, and we found similar uh, types of stress effects in rice. Uh, but we didn't study other crops. But there are a lot of papers you can find that, yes, the generalized, the, the, uh, I mean, whatever the stress, uh, mostly the it is all about oxidative stress. Huh? So whatever the, I mean, uh, forms of abiotic stress, it finally leads to the oxidative stress. And uh, there are, and uh, this is generalized key. So you can find uh, specific papers on uh, other crops also. Okay, sir. Thank you very much for your patience. I think all the questions are explained very, uh, uh, in a very well manner and all the participants are satisf satisfied with the explanations and the lecture. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. We thank hope you. that we, we can call you in our college and we thank can you. meet you yes. when the situation will be favorable. Thank you, thank sir. You, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Now, we will be heading towards our next technical session. I would like to invite Dr. Shomo Mukherjee, Assistant Professor of Department of Botany, Jungipur College. He is the coordinator of today's webinar. I request Dr. Mukherjee to kindly introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ravi Gupta. Over to you, Shomo. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, for the introduction. So, Good afternoon to one and all. Now I have the privilege to welcome to all of you to the second technical session of today's webinar. So I am again, nevertheless, thankful to the TIC, Dr. Navakumar Ghosh, the IQC coordinator, Dr. Vikash Kumar Panda, the organizing secretaries, and the entire committee for such a hard work for the past few weeks. So now in this session, we have an eminent researcher, Dr. Ravi Gupta. So I have the privilege to introduce to all of you Dr. Ravi Gupta, who has been working as an assistant professor at Kukmin University, Seoul, South Korea. Dr. Ravi Gupta had accomplished his PhD from the Department of Botany, University of Delhi, under the discipline of plant physiology and biochemistry. Later on, he worked for more than five years as a postdoctoral research fellow and a research professor at University of Busan, Busan, South Korea. He has authored more than 70 international and national publications. He has also authored several books. To his credit, he is a recipient of several prestigious national and international awards like the Ramalinga Swami Re-Entry Fellowship, the Ramanujan Fellowship, the ITS Fellowship from the Government of India and the Korea Research Fellowship from the Government of Korea. So he has a very enriched biodata. And in this context, I have the pleasure to say that myself had some academic togetherness with Dr. Gupta during our master's and PhD studies at the Department of Botany, University of Delhi. He has always been an excellent senior, uh, enlightening scholar and a person with a lot of knowledge for his guidance. So with these words, I cordially welcome Dr. Ravi Gupta to enlighten us with his lecture on the area of cold stress tolerance in a wonderful plant system that is hippophy, which is growing in the Himalayan region as a shrub. And in most part of the year, the plant is covered with snow. So let us know from him what are the enlightening facts which relate with cold stress tolerance. 
So with these words, I again welcome Dr. Gupta for his lecture. So over to Dr. Gupta. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Somu, for the nice introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank the uh, faculty members of Jangipur College for giving me this opportunity to talk uh, something very exciting and to re-cherish the memories of my PhD days. Actually, the work that I'm going to present today uh, was carried out my during my PhD. And uh, while going through my slides, I could just uh, remind my uh, those old campus days and uh, my trips uh, to the Himalayan region to collect uh, uh, this uh, particular plan. So I have noticed that Dr. Penka Khanduri has joined. So we used to visit uh, for uh, to some of the trips together and to collect this plant for our experimentation. So, okay, so just a moment, let me share my slides. Uh, okay, so I think Professor Zahir Hussain is still presenting. So I think he uh, first has to stop presenting and then only I can be able to present. Okay, so just a moment. Okay, so is my presentation visible? Yes, visible. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So the story that I'm going to tell uh, is all about the molecular dissection of uh, cold stress tolerance of a Himalayan plant, which is uh, known as Hippopyramnoides, and it's commonly known as Sibocron. And some of you might have already heard the name of this plant because of uh, uh, its uh, increasing demand, uh, uh, because of its uh, actually associated medicinal properties and its utilization in the field of cosmetics and medicines. And uh, actually this plant is rich in, uh, the berries of this plant uh, uh, are rich in vitamin C and vitamin E. So that's why uh, some juice companies are uh, producing juice out of these berries and uh, to produce some kind of anti-aging pro uh, products. Okay, so this plant actually grows in the upper Himalayan region of Leh and Ladakh and upper regions of uh, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand and Sikkim. So the, uh, the juice of this plant is uh, now available with the brand name of Layberries. Okay, so anyway, that is a completely a different story. And uh, my part uh, here uh, uh, is to talk about the cold tolerance properties of Sibokran, okay? So the story behind this work was uh, 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 initiated actually with a trip, a trip that my uh, PhD supervisor had long back in 2008. Actually, she was traveling to Gangotri and on the way to Gangotri, she found this plant growing uh, nearby, uh, in the nearby areas and thriving well in the extreme temperature conditions. So she realized actually that this plant could be a good source for the proteins uh, all this plant can be uh, used as a model system to identify the cold responsive proteins and genes and those cold responsive genes can later be transferred to some of the uh, cold susceptible crop plants to increase their cold tolerance properties as uh, uh, aptly discussed by Dr. Vikas. So as far as uh, cold stress is concerned, it is one of the most serious threats uh, to the crops these days and uh, this concern is progressively increasing because of uh, uh, the increase in greenhouse gases which are bringing temperature extremes so uh, because of these temperature extremes maybe you people have heard about the polar vortexing uh, because of these polar vortexing uh, 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 the temperature drops uh, up to minus 50 degrees celsius in some parts of us canada and uh, russia uh, i am aware that in 2000 uh, 12 and 2016, the temperature in New York City was uh, approximately minus 48 uh, due to this polar vortexing. So these greenhouse gases uh, basically brings out, uh, brings about the temperature extremes. Okay, so these uh, temperature extremes are not good for the crop production. And uh, actually, uh, 
when the temperature drops below the zero degree Celsius, it leads to the formation of ice crystals over the plants and uh, in the hypoplastic space of the plants. And these ice crystals are uh, actually uh, very damaging, and it uh, those ice crystals can damage the plasma membrane, which can lead to the death of the cell and ultimately the death of the whole plant. So this uh, it, uh, this is uh, one of the most uh, uh, serious concerns for the crop productivity around the globe. Okay, so if we just look at the this plant, you can just uh, see how the ice crystals are go, um, growing over these uh, the leaves of this plant, and just look at the uh, the morphology of these ice crystals. These are so pointed that uh, these can easily rupture uh, the plug membrane, and it can uh, just result in the death of whole plant during the thawing of this plant okay so uh, since our uh, most of the crop plants are susceptible to cold stress so uh, it's actually very important to understand the mechanism beh uh, behind the cold tolerance in some of the plants and to identify the the genes and the proteins uh, which provide tolerance to uh, on these um, cold tolerance plants okay uh, so as far as the cold tolerance properties of plants are concerned, so uh, plants prepare themselves uh, for tolerating the cold stress uh, when these are exposed to gradually decreasing but above zero temperatures uh, by a process which is known as cold acclimation. Okay, and uh, in addition to cold acclimation, uh, the freezing tolerance, freezing stress tolerance of some of the plants can be further enhanced when these are exposed to sub-zero temperatures. I mean. Uh, uh, the below zero degree Celsius temperatures and uh, in this uh, sub-zero acclimation is, uh, is always following the cold acclimation. So some plants when these are exposed to sub-zero acclimation following cold acclimation, uh, their cold tolerance or freezing stress tolerance can be further enhanced by a process which is known as sub-zero acclimation. And uh, during cold acclimation and sub-zero acclimation, plants secrete various kind of proteins and metabolites in the aboplast which act as first line of defense. So uh, my uh, my job was to identify these proteins uh, from the seabook town. Okay, so actually I was uh, very interested, and uh, I assumed that if this plant can thrive well in the temperature extremes, there must be some special proteins present in these uh, this plant. So that we need to identify. Okay. So these are some of the pictures of uh, seabook town uh, present in the snow-clad areas. And uh, you can just see the berries of the Sibukon plant, and it's uh, completely covered with the snow. So this, uh, these pictures actually attest the quality or attest the uh, the properties of Sibukon as a cold tolerant plant. Okay. So since Sibukon can only be found in the upper Himalayan region, so one of our uh, initial uh, um, uh, aim was to uh, find out or finalize some of the uh, sample collection site and uh, to collect the samples uh, 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 for our experimentations because uh, these berries are available only once in a year. So we had to visit every year to these places, uh, harvest, the, harvest the berries, bring them to laboratories and, and do the experiment for the rest of the year. So we finalized two sites uh, in the Himachal Pradesh region uh, of uh, Gamur and Loser. Uh, these are actually the two. Uh, uh, these two regions are in the Lahul and Spiti Valley of Himachal Pradesh. So we finalized these uh, locations based on the uh, actually uh, germplasm. So uh, uh, in some conferences uh, we visited, we came to know that the germplasm in uh, these two areas are, are quite fixed and it's uh, it's kind of uniform. So we selected these uh, two sample collection sites. So we used to visit every year to these sites, collect some berries, bring, uh, and bring those berries to uh, uh, Delhi. Okay, and uh, to do the experiments rest of the years. Okay, so. Uh, so when we brought the berries back to Delhi, our next aim was to uh, isolate the seeds out of it and to develop a seed germination procedure, okay, to perform the some of the experiments, okay. So actually, seabuckthorn seeds are very recalcitrant and it uh, they fail to germinate uh, in the Delhi temperature conditions. So uh, we did a literature survey and we observed, okay, that these seeds are in dormant condition and uh, it can take up to one year for their germination. So we tried uh, several kind of chemical-based methods for their stratification. 
so those methods certainly improved the germination but the growth of subsequent seedlings was not good enough actually those uh, because of the chemical treatments those seedlings uh, were uh, i mean the, uh, the growth of those seedlings were compromised and it was arrested uh, after certain days okay so we decided okay let's uh, let's uh, just use the deionized water and just incubate uh, the seeds for a longer period of time and then uh, uh, so we we actually found that if the seeds uh, are soaked for 5 days the germination percentage is maximum and it shows up to 60% of germination and so we selected these seeds i mean uh, so we used to uh, soak our seeds in the dnis water under the dark uh, condition and after 5 days uh, those seeds and the, those germinated seeds were transferred to germination uh, paper rolls uh, for the subsequent growth of seedlings okay so during the growth of seedlings we analyzed that okay seed buckthorn seeds uh, uh, during growth release some kind of phenolic compounds and sugars that attracts the growth of a, uh, an unknown black fungus okay so we could not identify which fungus is this uh, because that was actually not uh, our part of work so we uh, uh, had to just uh, get rid of this fungus so we just changed uh, this germination paper roll try a thrice a growing period of these seedlings so we observed that the 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 growth of the seedlings was um, best at 20 days so we selected these seedlings for further cold tolerance analysis okay so uh, for analyzing the cold tolerance properties of uh, these young sibucon seedlings we initially performed a droop test analysis so in droop test we exposed the plants uh, to um, uh, freezing stress and we analyzed uh, their drooping uh, uh, for uh, 5 days or 10 days or 15 days okay so what we did is uh, we selected the uh, sibucon seedlings and uh, we performed the droop test analysis and we also used uh, the seedlings of uh, tomato which is a cold sensitive plant and the seedlings of mustard uh, which is uh, a moderately cold uh, tolerant plant okay and then we compared the cold tolerance of sibucon seedlings with these two plants okay and then we uh, during droop test analysis we observed that uh, the seedlings of tomato and uh, Uh, mustard started drooping just uh, uh, within five hours of uh, uh, the freezing stress, while sibucon seedlings did not show any uh, sign of drooping even after five days. So this uh, actually these results, along with the results of some survival tests and iron leakage, they suggested that okay, uh, uh, even these uh, young seedlings of sibucon uh, uh, are able to tolerate uh, cold stress and freezing stress. Uh, Uh, very efficiently okay so we decided okay let's focus uh, uh, our work on these seedlings because uh, because it was not possible to go and collect sample uh, um, from the uh, uh, wild areas every time for the experimentation so we and devised this method for the laboratory uh, germination of uh, sibucon uh, seeds and uh, we developed a method for the cold treatment uh, freezing stress treatment and to analyze the uh, subsequent mechanism uh, underlying mechanism okay so uh, we decided to look for the proteins uh, that are responsible for uh, this cold tolerance properties of sibucon so actually uh, when we decided uh, for the proteome analysis or for, uh, for the global protein uh, analysis we realized that okay if we will uh, just use the uh, whole cell proteome uh, or whole cell protein it would be almost uh, impossible to uh to pick the right candidate okay because in whole cell there are actually uh, thousands of proteins and uh, uh and the actually the, these um, those thousands of proteins are majorly housekeeping proteins or the proteins involved in uh, photosynthesis like rubis collagen serpent and these proteins are actually very high abundant these are present in high copy number so identifying uh, a low abundant protein or maybe uh, all proteins which are actually responsible in cold stress signaling or some transcriptional factors these are actually very low abundance in nature their copy number is not too high so uh, we were afraid that if we will go for whole cell proteome analysis uh, the selection of right candidate or the uh, picking up the right candidate would be very difficult so then we decided okay let's go for the extracellular proteome analysis or the apoplastic proteome analysis and uh, we also uh, 
call this extracellular protein as secretome because it harbors the secreted proteins only. So these proteins are synthesized in nucleus and then because this contain uh, n terminal sig signal peptide, so these are secreted out uh, in the apoplastic region. So so that's why uh, so because uh, this region contain only secreted proteins it is al also known as secretome okay so why extracellular proteome because this is the uh, actually outermost region of the cell which is in direct contact with the atmosphere and it is the region where ice formation takes place okay so uh, if uh, uh, if there are uh, uh, there is ice formation taking place in this region then uh, we we assume that there must be certain proteins which are interacting with the ice okay and the proteins in the apoplast or extracellular proteome uh, acts as first line of defense, okay? And it also includes some stress-related proteins like some PR proteins, pathogenesis-related proteins which participate in plant defense. In addition, these proteins are also involved in signaling, plant person interaction, defense, and uh, water and nutrient transport. So if uh, uh, we just focus on uh, this kind of subcellular proteome analysis, the chances of picking up the right candidate is uh, uh, is increased because we don't need to tackle up with the high abundant proteins such as Robisco, large subunit, small subunit, uh, and other house, uh, housekeeping proteins uh, involved in uh, cellular respiration and uh, other uh, processes. Okay, so so we decided to uh, analyze the extracellular proteome. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, so we, we finalized, but there were certain limitations or certain hurdles uh, uh, for the analysis of uh, this kind of subcellular or uh, apoplastic proteome. What were uh, those limitations? Actually, those proteins are, as I informed you, uh, you those are uh, present in uh, very low abundance. Their copy number is too less. I mean, if the same protein is present, uh, Suppose uh, uh, 1,000 copies of, of uh, a particular protein is present in cytoplasm, it is possible that in apoplast uh, only 100 or just 80 copies are present. So uh, these are actually present in very low abundance. And uh, uh, the identification of these proteins by mass spectrometry is relatively challenging. Okay, So this was one of the major limitations. And uh, the next limitation was the contamination from other organelles. Okay? So during the isolation of apoplastic proteins, there are chances that uh, we could get uh, uh, the contaminant proteins from other cellular organelles like mitochondria, chloroplast, or cytoplasm. And these uh, proteins, if we detect uh, in the apoplastic region, these uh, could uh, actually provide some false positive results. So, so we had to actually uh, neglect this contamination also. Okay, so we had to tackle these two problems. Okay, and so we. Uh, had to uh, optimize our extraction method in a way to uh, increase the protein yield, okay, to increase the yield of these low abundance proteins and uh, subsequently uh, 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 reducing the contamination from other organisms, okay. So this is actually a typical workflow for the isolation of apoplastic proteins. So it involves uh, the vacuum infiltration of uh, small segments of the plants. Okay, and uh, uh, we just uh, cut small segments of the plant, pack them in a syringe, and incubate them in a uh, buffer condition. And uh, then we centrifuge to get the apoplastic proteins out of that. Okay, so there are actually two steps that needs to be optimized. One is the selection of buffer. And another, was, uh, another one was selection of centrifugation speed. Okay, so if we increase the centrifugation speed, uh, there are cer uh, certainly the, the yield would, would increase, but there are chances that at higher centrifugation speed, uh, there could be uh, damage to the plasma membrane and thus and the chances of uh, identifying the contaminant proteins in uh, the apoplastic fraction would be too high. And in case of buffer system, we had to uh, select the right uh, buffer that uh, is actually not lethal for the cell uh, organelles. And uh, I mean, it should be uh, not uh, lethal for the plasma membrane uh, and uh, to other cell organelles uh, so that the contamination can be uh, reduced. Okay, so in case of buffer, we select five buffer com uh, combination, just water, ascorbic acid, ascorbic acid plus calcium chloride or magnesium chloride and trace. So these buffers uh, we selected based on the previous literature. There were, uh, there were actually um, studies on apoplastic proteome analysis and different plants, uh, for different plants, different buffer system was used. So in our case, we had to optimize for the sibuprofen. Okay, and in case of uh, uh, centrifugation speed, we, uh, we tried uh, a range of 1000 to 6000. So we isolated proteins from different buffer system 
and uh, we resolve them on sts page and uh, based on the presence or absence of uh, rubisco large subunit this lsu is large subunit of rubisco actually this is uh, uh, this is a chloroplastic marker enzyme so if this is present in the apoplastic extract that means there is a contamination from chloroplast okay so this is uh, uh, one of the most simplest way to detect the detect the contamination so based on the presence of uh, presence or absence of this large subunit we uh, we found that okay this uh, ascorbic acid and calcium chloride uh, buffer system uh, uh, gave best results okay and uh, as there was no rubisco contamination in this system okay and if we go uh, for the on this side so we can see some contamination of rubisco so we selected this buffer system and then we tried different combination of uh, centrifugation speed and we observed that okay 4000 g uh, gives highest yield without compromising the protein yield okay so to uh, so we finalize i mean uh, this uh, buffer system and this centrifugation speed for the isolation of our apoplastic proteins okay and uh, to further confirm uh, the contamination uh, in uh, uh, contamination in isolated apoplastic proteins we checked the activity of a cytoplasmic marker protein that is glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase okay so we observed that the uh, the activity of uh, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase was less than 3% in all the samples uh, in all the isol uh, apoplastic extract samples so this suggest okay uh, this uh, 3% is a kind of uh, uh, negligible cytoplasmic contamination and it's kind of permissible limit that we can proceed further okay so we we finalize this uh, 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 combination of uh, buffer system for the isolation of apoplastic protein from the young seedlings of sibutron okay so uh, um, after uh, optimizing the protein isolation procedure and uh, we had two choices for the analysis of proteome so we could and do the gel based proteome analysis and we could also go for the gel free proteome analysis so in case of gel based proteome uh, analysis the isolated proteins are uh, resolved on polyacrylamide gel and the and then and differential proteins are picked up from the gel and identified by mass spectrometry in case of gel free the isolated proteins are directly subjected to in solution trypsin digestion and uh, to generate a set of peptides those peptides are separated on hplc and uh, those are subsequently identified by mass spectrometry and uh, using a set of algorithm we can identify the abundance of those uh, uh, proteins or peptides in control as well as cold extract samples okay so this is how we can find out okay which are the proteins which are showing cold induced or cold uh, stress modulated abundance uh, change in abundance okay so first we use the uh, uh, 2d based approach for the uh, for the identifying uh for the identification of uh, cold res stress responsive protein so uh, these are the representative 2d gels of uh, control and uh, cold stress uh, treated sibutron seedlings so like uh, we used uh, different sample sets like like 4 degree celsius for one day and 4 degree celsius uh, for one day followed by freezing stress of 5 uh, minus 5 degree celsius 4 degree celsius for 5 days 4 degree celsius for 5 days followed by minus 5 degree celsius and then a recovery sample okay so using this combination uh, we could uh, in, in uh, we could identify uh, approximately 255 protein spots on 2d gels and out of these 255 protein spots the abundance of 61 protein spots were changed in response to cold or freezing stress okay so we picked up these uh, differential uh, protein spots from the 2d gels and uh, we identified those differential proteins by mass spectrometry okay and uh, so actually this was a kind of first study on the uh, proteome analysis of uh, this uh, sibutron plant so we sub, uh, we submitted uh, submitted this data to world food database repository uh, it's a kind of uh, database i mean if someone wants to um, uh, know the information about the sibutron apoplastic proteins they can just go to uh, this uh, database database number 53 and they they can retrieve the information on the differential protein from this database okay so together with the 2d gel analysis we also did uh, gel free analysis and uh, using a shortened proteomics approach and uh, using this gel free uh, analysis we could identify 100 and, uh, uh, 118 protein spots with a confidence of more than uh, 99% okay so uh, actually 
uh, the gel free uh, approaches yield uh, a, a much higher number of uh, proteins identification as compared to gel based approach but in this case actually uh, the, the uh, there were no uh, not uh, many um, and, uh, gene sequences submitted for this particular plant in the database so uh, identification of these proteins even if we get a very good spectra was relatively challenging okay so anyway we could identify 118 protein uh, with 99 percent confidence and then we checked for the uh, uh, cold stress responsive protein so uh, we did some kind of clustering analysis and we uh, using heat map we could uh, uh, we could uh, identify the proteins which are highly expressed or showing highest abundance in fridging stress and in different samples of uh, cold stress and fridging stress treatment. So in this, uh, we could uh, see a different uh, kind of PR proteins, chitinase and uh, detail uh, SL modifier like uh, lipase and superoxide dismutase, and calmodulin and uh, glyoxylase. Okay. So there were very interesting candidates in uh, this category. Okay. So whenever we do a uh, kind of uh, high throughput omics uh, analysis, it's always uh, uh, suggested or it's always required to validate uh, the protein identification. I mean, validation uh, part uh, helps us in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in removing the false positive. Like if, um, uh, we have to validate whether these uh, uh, mass spec data is uh, actually uh, correct or not. So uh, this validation part can be done using Western blot analysis or uh, real-time PCR or activity analysis. So in our case, we uh, for the validation, we used uh, enzymatic activity analysis and uh, uh, we selected three candidates, including uh, superoxide dismutase, uh, glyoxylase 1, and chitinase for the validation. So uh, while doing the activity analysis, we could not detect the activity of glyoxylase 1 in the apoplastic region, probably because of some post translation modification, or it could be a, a false positive in uh, apoplast. I mean, it could be a contaminant protein. Okay. So, but uh, the activity of other two um, proteins, uh, including chitinase and superoxide dismutase, um, was available, uh, was detected in apoplastic region, and it was actually increased during cold acclimation as uh, per the results of 2D and gels. So, so these, uh, uh, this activity analysis actually uh, uh, further validated the gels obtained from the 2D gels. Okay. So what next? We did uh, 2D gels, uh, we did gel free, and then we identified um, uh, some of the um, uh, cold uh, stress responsive proteins, then, then what next? Okay. And uh, so this, uh, after this analysis, I mean, we were kind of stuck. And then we did some kind of literature survey, and then uh, we were, I mean, very interested to see these two candidates, uh, chitinase and thomatin like protein. Actually, these are uh, proteins which have been uh, identified in uh, other plants, and these play uh, these proteins play uh, interface activity in different plants. So. So we realized, okay, this could be interesting candidates and this could also play antifreeze activity in Cibuctin also. So we decided to analyze these proteins further. So actually antifreeze proteins are a class, a class of polypeptides that binds to uh, ice crystals and inhibit their growth. Okay, so if uh, actually uh, at the time of sub uh, zero temperatures or freezing stress, uh, there are various ice crystals uh, that are formed in the apoplastic region and those smaller ice crystals um, join uh, together to form a bigger ice crystal and this is actually energy favoring uh, phenomena this is uh, uh, spontaneous phenomena actually this is to uh, reduce the surface area so this is a spontaneous kind of uh, reaction so these uh, uh, larger ice crystals which are formed by the joining of the smaller ice crystals uh, these are lethal because these can damage the plasma membrane okay so antiphase proteins bind to the ice crystals and inhibit their further growth okay they uh, they basically prevent the addition of water molecules uh, to the uh, uh, growing ice crystal plane so uh, this is the first thing uh, uh, by which they can inhibit the growth of ice crystal and the second uh, phenomenon is they can also inhibit the joining of two uh, two smaller ice crystals to form a bigger one okay so this is the role of antifreeze protein so we decided okay uh, just uh, 
uh, okay, uh, just focus on these proteins and check whether these uh, proteins uh, exhibit uh, antifreeze activity or not, or to first check whether antifreeze proteins are uh, present in seboxone or not. Okay, so this is kind of a uh, uh, quite different area, and uh, these antifreeze proteins are um, kind of very interesting. And uh, uh, when I was doing this uh, experiment, only 16 plants showed antifreeze activity, and uh, if we could detect uh, the antifreeze activity in seboxone, it could be kind of 17 plant. Okay, and uh, there was not much information on these uh, proteins. Uh, in case of plants, uh, these proteins were initially discovered in 1970 in some uh, marine fish. Uh, actually, uh, one scientist, and he rise, and he was uh, he was uh, visiting Antarctica, and he observed that uh, uh, some of the fishes, okay, they can thrive well in the uh, oceans, even though the temperature of ocean is minus uh, 40 degrees Celsius, and uh, uh, the upper layer of the ocean is covered by uh, ice. So he realized, okay, there should be some uh, kind of proteins uh, um, uh, that are providing uh, this phasing stress. So uh, uh, that deep rice scientist, he uh, identified these antifish proteins in the blood plasma uh, and the plasma of um, these fishes, okay? So this is how antifish proteins were discovered back in 1970, but in case of plants, these were first uh, detected in 1995 in winter rye, okay? And uh, there was not much information on these uh, proteins in plants. So we uh, just uh, um, realized, okay, then uh, just go ahead with these proteins and analyze these proteins further in Cibocon, if present, okay? So for antifish uh, activity analysis, uh, we had to, uh, develop a complete new setup. I mean, the activity analysis of antifreeze proteins is quite uh, difficult and it's very challenging. So antifreeze proteins uh, exhibit two major properties. The first one is thermal hysteresis and thermal hysteresis is kind of uh, depression of freezing point below the melting point of a solution. I mean, uh, when the antifreeze proteins are present, they depress the freezing point without affecting the melting point, thereby causing a difference, which is known as uh, thermal hysteresis. So this thermal hysteresis uh, thing we can measure using a, an instrument. Okay, and the another property of uh, antifreeze protein is ice recrystallization inhibition. So as I explained previously, that is smaller ice crystals join together to form a bigger ice crystal. And this form uh, this process of joining a smaller ice crystal to form a bigger ice crystal is known as ice recrystallization. And antifreeze proteins inhibit this ice recrystallization. Okay. So suppose this is the uh, ice crystal in presence of uh, antifreeze proteins. When antifreeze proteins are present, it would be uh, some, uh, some, uh, somewhat smaller, okay, because uh, of the inhibition of ice recrystallization, okay. So the question was how to detect the antifreeze activity uh, in vitro, okay. So we can check the shapes of ice crystal. So Actually, this is very interesting phenomena. Uh, in the absence of antifreeze proteins, uh, ice crystals are circular in shape and they are disc shaped. And uh, in the presence of antifreeze proteins, these are hexagonal or kind of pointed hexagonal. Okay, so just by looking at the shapes of ice crystal, we can find uh, we can uh, we can detect the presence or absence of antifreeze activity. Okay, we can check the sizes of ice crystals. So as I told you that uh, in the absence of antifreeze activity. Uh, uh, proteins, the ice crystal uh, would be in a larger size, and in case uh, of uh, uh, presence of antifreeze activity, the ice crystal would be smaller in size. So we can just uh, check the size of ice crystals, and we can also measure the thermal hysteresis. Okay. So for the measurement of thermal hysteresis and shape, analyzing the shapes of ice crystals, we need a, a, a instrument which is known as nanoliter osmometer. So in uh, uh, and for analyzing the size of ice crystal we had to uh, develop a splat assay system. So I've, I'll be explaining uh, these systems in the upcoming slides. So, okay. So this is kind of a setup for nanoliter osmometer. So this is a, a microscope and this is a freezing stage. Okay, so in this freezing stage, the temperature can be dropped up to minus 20 degrees Celsius and uh, within a fraction of seconds. Okay, so this is kind of snap frozen. Okay, so we snap frozen uh, our, uh, our protein solution and then we increase the temperature and uh, uh, the temperature of uh, this freezing stage is uh, maintained by a cooling bath. Okay, so we actually load our protein sample in a sample holder containing disk 
and this is the uh, i mean zoomed version of that disk so it contains several holes in the millimeter and in this uh, uh, in the in this sample holder containing disk there are several wells and in these wells we have to load our protein sample in nanoliter uh, uh, volume so just imagine how difficult it would be to load a nanoliter volume of sample and uh, this, so this whole setup we have to perform under a microscope okay so so we developed this nanoliter osmometer uh, setup in our lab so this is kind of setup that we prepared in our laboratory so this is uh, a cooling bath this is nanoliter osmometer and this of course contrast microscope a camera to capture the movement of uh, uh, um, to capture the growth of ice crystals and this is a freezing stage that is uh, connected to the nanoliter osmometer and uh, and this cooling bath okay so and then so proof and which that i say this is to analyze the ice ray crystallization inhibition so in this case we uh, in this case we can use the microliter volume okay so what we have to do uh, just dissolve our proteins in 30% sucrose make a sandwich between two round cover slip and uh, uh, snap froze uh, we have uh, we have to snap uh, snap frozen this uh, uh, sandwich Uh, in minus eighty, and then uh, subsequently we have to transfer uh, it in a, a minus six degrees Celsius uh, chamber. Okay, so this is kind of glass chamber, uh, and the temperature is maintained at minus six degrees Celsius with the help of different coolings. Okay, so and uh, we can observe the shapes, uh, the size of ice crystal under a microscope. So these two setup we uh, prepared in our laboratory for the detection of antifreeze activity. so uh, using this setup we detected antifreeze uh, activity in sebuctone seedlings in seedlings okay so which uh, which uh, we checked the antifreeze activity in the buffer system and bsa which we use as a negative control so uh, in both of these cases we could observe the circular ice crystals that means the absence of antifreeze activity and the ice crystals were relatively bigger in size so there was no ice ray crystallization inhibition in the control sample control means and the apoplastic proteins isolated from the uh, control uh, seedlings i mean at 24 degrees celsius uh, seedlings without any cold treatment okay so uh, in this case also uh, the uh, there was no antifreeze activity so when we analyze the uh, antifreeze activity in uh, freezing stress treated seedlings we could observe a, a slightly hexagonal ice crystals this uh, actually indicate a weak uh, antifreeze activity and that we could, could assume because there could be any uh, there could be various other uh, proteins which does not uh, which do not play antifreeze activity so we um, but anyway we could detect antifreeze activity uh, in the freezing stress treated sebuctone seedling so to further characterize those proteins on those activity we uh, gave a heat treatment to find out whether the antifreeze proteins are heat stable or heat labile so we could uh, we observed that okay after heat treatment the uh, the activity was uh, partially going down so we uh, i mean we assume that okay some part is heat stable some part is heat labile and then to confirm whether the activity is because of the protein part only and it's not because of any other component so we treated the proteins with protein sk and uh, after protein sk treatment the activity lost so this confirms that okay the activity was because of any protein component okay and then we uh, we also measured the iri as the crystallization inhibition activity and thermal stresses activity and then next we uh, next we catalog, catalog the uh, antifreeze all the antifreeze proteins present in sebuctone apoplast so for this we isolated the apoplastic proteins resolved them in a native phase gel okay not in as just phase because in as just phase proteins can be denatured so we uh, we uh, resolved the proteins on a native phase and then uh, we could observe 11 proteins in that native phase okay and then we isolated these proteins one by one and then check for the antifreeze activity and then uh, we observed that uh, antifreeze activity was associated uh, with the protein of uh, 10 kda 31 kda 34 kda and uh, 41 kda okay so then we decided okay let's try to uh, purify these proteins um, further and uh, characterize these proteins further in detail okay so uh, the biggest question was how to purify these proteins okay so then again a literature survey and then we observed a mechanism which is known as ice affinity chromatography so this is kind of a interesting uh, affinity so 
uh, what we have to do we have to uh, make a kind of uh, brass finger okay so in this brass finger this is kind of hollow from inside so coolant goes from one direction and it comes out from the other direction so this uh, brass finger um, uh, needs to be connected with a water bath and uh, uh, to to uh, to maintain the temperature of this brass finger so and this is uh, a glass beaker uh, uh, kept over a magnetic stirrer to stir the protein sample so we have to keep our protein sample in, in this glass beaker and keep uh, keep it rotating and this brass finger needs to be submerged in this solution and the temperature needs to be gradually decreased so if there are some antithesis proteins in this uh, it will attach to the uh, ice that is formed on this ice crystal okay uh, on uh, this brass finger okay so this is how it uh, ice up uh, the process of ice affinity work okay so initially uh, we can see a very thin layer of ice uh, uh, and then with this thin layer of ice we uh, submerge in the protein solution and uh, uh, we stir the sample uh, quickly and then there, if there are some antifreeze proteins uh, they can bind to this ice and uh, and then we uh, after completion of this uh, whole setup we can just melt down melt down this uh, uh, ice part and then lyophilize and then we can reconstitute uh, this lyophilized proteins and then we can check if there are some proteins and this so if there are some and this proteins those could be ice binding protein okay so yeah so this is the depiction in another way so ice uh, afp solution so antifreeze proteins keep on binding while other salts or uh, uh, other salts or non antifreeze proteins remain in the solution so this is uh, how a brass finger looks like after the completion of ice affinity chromatography so you can see a uh, i mean two kind of uh, ice formed so this kind of ice is uh, kind of waste for us because this represent a quick uh, freezing so in this case uh, uh, our result uh, our experiment is kind of failed because this is uh, this represent quick uh, uh, freezing so antifreeze proteins does not get in uh, do not get enough time to bind to this uh, and growing ice crystal plane while this uh, transparent kind of ice these are uh, this uh, is very good kind of uh, ice and it is uh, formed uh, uh, in a progressive manner so antifreeze proteins get enough time to bind to this ice crystal plane okay so using this ice uh, affinity chromatography we could identify uh, 40 uh, 41 kilo dalton protein and in addition uh, we could also identify two more proteins using chitin affinity chromatography so because in our uh, apo plus protein analysis we identify two chitin uh, uh, two chitinases so we uh, we tried a chitin affinity chromatography and we could identify uh, 34 and 31 kga polypeptide so these are the stress phase gels that uh, shows the purification procedure so this is the purification of that 41 kda uh, protein and this is the purification of 34 and 31 kda protein okay so okay so the identity of this 41 kda protein was uh, uh, i mean determined by mass spectrometry analysis while these two proteins were not getting identified by mass spectrometry analysis so we uh, we went for uh, n terminal sequencing analysis so in case of uh, that 34 kda protein uh, it could not be its n terminal sequence could not be uh, determined because its n terminal was blocked while uh, the 31 kda protein uh, could be uh, sequenced by n terminal sequencing so uh, this is the the sequence of uh, n terminal sequence of uh, uh, that HRCHT1B uh, and it matched with the class 1 chitinase of rice and endo chitinase of protein vulgar and in addition it also matched with the interface proteins of uh, um, uh, insect and uh, winter flounder and interface glycoprotein okay so we then get the interface activity analysis and again in buffer and negative control BSA we could observe the uh, subglo ice crystal and no ice crystallization inhibition while the purified protein showed a very high level of antifreeze activity as could be uh, observed by the development of perfectly hexagonal ice crystals and a uh, high amount of ice recrystallization inhibition activity you can just uh, i mean compare the the sizes of ice crystals in uh, in uh, 
control condition and in presence of antifreeze uh, proteins okay so and then uh, we interested uh, interestedly finding uh, we also find uh, that uh, the if those chitinase uh, proteins are identified even from the non acclimated seedlings they also exhibit antifreeze activity while in previous reports uh there was no such kind of uh, study performed so previous all the previous studies they just highlighted that uh, the chitinous proteins acquire antifreeze activity at the time of cold acclimation and uh, uh, if you just analyze the uh, chitinous proteins isolated from non acclimated seedlings they cannot exhibit antifreeze activity but in our case it was uh, something different in our case we could identify the antifreeze activity uh, in the chitinases isolated even from the non acclimated seedlings but the uh, the uh, the antifreeze activity was uh, relatively lower as compared to uh, the same uh, counterparts when isolated from the cold acclimated seedling so we uh, we we thought that okay there are some uh, transition uh, during cold acclimation which increases the cold uh, uh, which increases the antifreeze activity of these chitinases in addition we also did the antifreeze activity of pgip that is polyglycolinase inhibitor protein it is of 41 kda and uh, just uh, you can see the very beautiful hexagonal ice crystals in addition we could also find uh, the development of uh, very beautiful flower shaped ice crystals uh, at a very high uh, concentration of uh, chitinase so this actually uh, these kind of uh, analysis uh, further attest Uh, uh association of a high level of antifreeze activity in the purified chitinases okay so since uh, the purified chitinase also uh, antenna sequence of purified chitinase also matches with the antifreeze glycoprotein of the insect so we uh, we attempted to analyze the glycosylation of it and moreover the size uh, of uh, two chitinases uh, isolated uh, Uh, was 34 and 31 kda so we also had an impression that okay the 34 kda chitinase could be the glycosylated form of 31 kda chitinase okay so we just wanted to check okay whether um, both are glycosylated or not so we did a con a peroxidase staining and then we could identify that okay yes the upper one 34 kda is glycosylated while the 31 kda uh, uh, chitinase is non glycosylated so this further uh, i mean support our uh, observation that okay this 134 kda chitinase could be the glycosylated form of the same 31 kda chitinase okay so which we, uh, we tried to deglycosylate uh, this 34 kda uh, glycosylated proteins using both pn uh, this uh, n glycosidase and o glycosidase but uh, we failed i don't know why because Uh, i don't know why maybe uh, because uh, uh, um, this glycosylation was resistant to the enzymatic deglycosylate and uh, deglycosidases so we used a chemical based method we used uh, uh, i don't remember the name of that um, acid perfectly uh, but it was something tri uh, trichloromethane sulfonic acid oh, yeah no trichloromethane sulfonic acid so using that uh, 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 acid we could deglycosylate uh, this 34 kda uh, glycosylated protein but we observed that okay after deglycosylation it is uh, coming to uh, this 34 uh, uh, kda protein is coming to uh, just 32.5 just 1.5 k difference and this 31 kda uh, chitinase is a different uh, version of chitinase and it's not the deglycosylated part of the same chitinase okay so then we decided to check okay let's uh, now we have the deglycosylated uh, protein so let's check uh, whether the uh, deglycosylated protein also exhibit antifreeze activity or not i mean uh, to analyze we wanted to analyze whether glycosylation uh, of uh, this chitinase play uh, plays any role in acquiring the antifreeze activity or not okay so we uh, we also had an impression that okay uh, it is possible that during Uh, cold acclimation the glycosylation part is increased and that uh, actually increases the antifreeze activity of this chitinase so we check the antifreeze activity of the glycosylated chitinases and then um, to our surprise even the deglycosylated chitinase exhibited similar level of antifreeze activity so this neglected uh, the role of uh, glycosylation in 
uh, in the in acquiring the antifreeze activity and similarly we observed uh, uh, in case of pgip so both of these proteins were glycosylated we glycosylated these proteins and checked for antifreeze activity and uh, we could not detect any anti uh, level in uh, any difference in the, their antifreeze activity uh, levels after their deglycosylation so then we tried to find out okay what could be other factors um, that uh, leads to the increase in antifreeze activity at the time of cold acclimation so we did again literature survey and we found that okay during cold acclimation uh, the concentration of calcium increases in the apoplast okay so uh, the calcium is released uh, from the cell wall and uh, during cold acclimation and the concentration is quite high and to detect this uh, increased calcium concentration we uh, 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 cells secret various proteins like calmodulin and uh, calnexin okay that detect uh, that binds to this uh, uh, high level of calcium okay so we detected calmodulin in our apoplastic protein analysis also so uh, we uh, realized okay let's check the role of calcium in transition of antifreeze activity okay so when we uh, for this kind of analysis we uh, we incubated our purified proteins with uh, calcium uh, 0, uh, 0, uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 millimolar and then we check for the antifreeze activity so this is ice crystal diameter so if ice crystal diameter is going down that means antifreeze activity is increasing so we observed that uh, yes and uh, there was a significant difference although very less but there was a significant difference uh, that was approximately 20, 20 or 22 percent uh, in presence of calcium okay and uh, the hydrolytic activity uh, was uh, going down okay so hydrolytic activity was going down and antifreeze activity was increasing okay so this uh, from this analysis we assume that okay uh, probably it's the calcium which is released during cold acclimation uh, it converts the hydrolytic activity of uh, uh, chitinases to antifreeze activity okay and then uh, we check the antifreeze activity in presence of calcium and in presence of calcium chelator, EGTA, and uh, uh, these results further supported our this observation. So uh, we tried to find out, okay, if there is any uh, difference in the secondary structure in presence of calcium. So uh, we did the CD analysis, circular dichroism, and uh, uh, we observed that, okay, both of uh, these uh, proteins Titanages uh, were rich in uh, highly rich in unusual beta uh, plated sheets. Okay, so actually these beta plated sheets are relatively uh, flat. Okay, and these provide a better uh, uh, these offer a better surface uh, uh, to the AFPs to bind to the antifreeze proteins. So if uh, if the proteins are coiled, they cannot um, uh, bind very efficiently with the uh, ice crystals. So we we thought okay okay because of these uh, because of the presence of these beta plated structures and these proteins can bind to the ice crystals uh, in an efficient way okay and then we observed that okay in presence of calcium yes there is a slight change in uh, secondary structure and the content of beta plated sheets increase in presence of calcium okay so because of this calcium mediated increase in beta plated sheets they can efficiently bind uh, more efficiently bind to the ice crystals and perform antifreeze activity in a better way so this was kind of our conclusion and uh, in, a, in, a, in addition uh, we also did some thermal uh, analysis so i'll just skip this part i'm not um, going to detail and uh, to sum up uh, actually antifreeze proteins are um, they are kind of very demanding uh, um, they are in very demand these days because of their associated commercial properties. They and they are required in agriculture uh, and uh, they uh, to prevent the frost damage in crop plants. So, so they can just uh, uh, be spread over the uh, crop plants to prevent the frost damage. And uh, in food industry, they can be incorporated to some ice creams uh, to maintain their texture during their freeze thaw and in biomedical. And uh, in case of biomedical, uh, it can be used to preserve uh, the human cell lines and human organs and sorry, animals, uh, other animal organs uh, at a lower temperature without any uh, injuries. Okay, so uh, to conclude, I mean, uh, my PhD work, I did some uh, 
kind of cryoprotective analysis of uh, the purified uh, chitinase and then we observe that okay if uh, the rat rbc is uh, stored at 4 degrees celsius in absence of antifreeze proteins uh, there is a uh, 50% higher leakage of hemoglobin than those stored with antifreeze protein so this uh, actually analysis uh, suggested that uh, antifreeze proteins can uh, isolated from sebum form can help preservation in the rat rbcs at lower temperature but this is very kind of crude experiment so we need further analysis uh, for uh, to confirm this kind of observation okay so with this i would like to end up my presentation so that's all i mean and at the end i would like to thank professor anandesh uh, pal my supervisor who designed this whole uh, work and department of biotechnology for the financial support and thank you for your patience okay so thank you dr gupta for such a nice presentation so it was indeed a very tedious task it might have been such a time taking and pains taking job to isolate those anti freezing proteins and going towards characterization so i congratulate you for such a nice work which can be having substantial applications in future so uh, i just wanted to know dr gupta that uh, for example if we consider any tropical plant which is growing in a normal temperature year wide so suppose we are giving some cold stress treatment so are there any expectations to obtain the expression of this type of proteins or are they only present in such uh, yeah, I, i don't think those proteins would be available uh, in the tropical plants uh, because they are they really don't face the cold stress so plant in my opinion plant uh, will not produce any such kind of proteins i mean or maybe those proteins are not available in their genome even if uh, they can produce chitinases uh, i don't think those chitinases can acquire antifreeze activity at the time of cold acclimation because tropical plants when they are exposed to cold acclimation they cannot uh, even face uh, that the short period of cold acclimation and they can die so even if there is a release of calcium and there could be a transition of uh, um, there could be a kind of change in secondary structure i don't think we could uh, detect any such activity but yeah maybe we can test definitely so is it possible to increase the amount of afps by putting some extracellular osmolites like mannitol or maybe some other compounds to this plant sibacthron uh, so yeah very yeah. possible yes possible so this part we can definitely analyze and then we have to finalize actually uh, find some elicitors uh, okay um, Could could be uh, phyto hormone, or could be various PGPRs, or could be different pathogens, and uh, those can in, uh, actually increase the level of antifreeze protein. So that could be uh, yes, one kind of analysis that can be done in future. Okay. So uh, last question from my side: uh, Did you have any hurdles to germinate the seeds for sibacthron in your lab? Like uh, it was. Uh, quite yes. from the yes. natural conditions yeah, yeah it was a kind of almost impossible for us initially so initially we just tried one or two days of soaking uh, sibutan seeds and uh, we just um, planted them in germination paper roll on or in soil and uh, we waited for a long time and we could not um, get a successful germination so so that's why i uh, tried uh, various stratification method to uh, reduce the dormancy period of uh, sibucton seeds so as i explained that uh, those actually increase the, uh, the the rate of germination but the growth of subsequent seedlings was not good enough to be used okay. for uh, cold tolerance analysis i mean th those were not very healthy so uh, then we decided to increase the incubation period and finally we could get uh, good germination product. so the lowest temperature was minus 5 which you went yeah cool. okay, okay. Mm. thank you Okay so uh, thank you Dr Gupta now the session is open for any questions so i would request the audience so if you are having any questions you may please contact him and so that we can have an interaction one questions uh, Dr Ravi Gupta from my side okay uh, actually i want to know the plant is uh, hippopyramnoids is also a drought 
drought resistance also salt stressed plants okay. mm -hmm. is there any correlation between the uh, three uh, yeah. yeah there is uh, definitely uh, a correlation like even if uh, there is a cold stress so that leads to the formation uh, during freezing stress that leads to the formation of ice crystals in the apoplast so because of uh, formation of ice crystals in the apoplast the water potential of apoplastic region goes down and because of that uh, uh, the water from the cytosolic uh, region uh, moves outside okay exosmosis takes place so that results in drought stress okay so cold stress is always accompanied by drought stress similarly in case of salt stress also uh, when there is a high salt concentration in soil so that uh, decreases the water potential and because of that uh, uh, water moves out from the plant and that results in drought stress so this kind of correlation is always available between different stresses okay and and another question as uh, any relation between the the plant is symbiotic with the franchia okay mm -hmm, symbiotic yeah. has existed so mm -hmm. is there any relations between the cold stress and anti freezing protein and also this association Um, any contribution from this yeah, association symbiotic association we did not check and i did not uh, uh, encounter any such publication but yeah, that can be checked yeah, so if the plant is uh, having symbiotic relationship what's the level of anti freeze uh, proteins and if there is no symbiotic relationship uh, uh, how uh, is there any difference in the levels of anti freeze activity or is there any uh, differences in the uh, expression level, level of the, those transcripts so that can be checked okay thank you welcome for your answers so okay, is sir, any uh, uh, i have one question uh, i'm uh, chunki choudhury uh, from uh, jonipur college uh, i want to ask you uh, first i will uh, be uh, thanking dr gupta for the nice presentation and uh, it is the subject of appreciation that the laborious and lengthy task he has done uh, thank you i just want to ask a general question uh, that uh, whatever observation you have find in your uh, study uh, can it be used as a model study for other economically important shrubs of uh, same habitat means uh, uh, the shrubs which are uh, which are dwelling in the um, uh, temperature below freezing point maybe from other different areas can be uh, can hippopy uh, study will uh, be used as the model uh, for those uh, plant species uh, no i don't think so we cannot generalize the process of this freezing tolerance or secretion of anti freeze proteins in all the uh plants uh, that uh, has uh, that have similar kind of habitat because uh, the the properties of this freezing tolerance is quite different in different plants some uh, some plants uh, utilize freeze avoidance mechanism they just uh, avoid the uh, process of freezing okay so they uh, what they uh, actually do they secrete some uh, compounds like uh, dr somu explained some mannitol or some osmolite kind of things to super cool their apoplastic sap so they inhibit or they prevent the formation of ice crystals in their apoplast so that is kind of freeze avoidance response okay and uh, the sibukton is uh, uh, showing freeze tolerance response in which the ice formation takes place but there are proteins to limit uh, the growth of those ice crystals so in my opinion i don't think that we can generalize the process of this uh freezing tolerance of sibukton with other shrubs and uh, herbs growing nearby okay okay thank you uh, dr gupta uh, i'm done with my question thank you okay so if you can i ask a question uh, yeah yeah please yeah uh, hello hello ravi i am dr priyanka kanduri uh, i have this just as uh, out of curiosity i want to know that you, that you mentioned that when the uh, there are there is this presence of afp the ice crystals they take this uh, hexagonal shape why would it do so won't it be easier for them to you know kind of accumulate and turn into bigger crystals rather than when they are in that spherical form uh, no actually uh, ice crystals uh when they grow they have two kind of planes one is basal plane and one is uh, uh prism plane okay so 
the growth of ice crystal is because of the addition of water molecule to the prism plane and uh, because of uh, this addition uh, the size uh, continuously increases and those disk shaped ice crystals just increase in their size okay but what afp is to uh, i uh, actually excluded that slide from my presentation so what afp is do they bind to the prism plane and uh, uh, prism plane of the ice crystals and the basal planes remain open okay so the growth of ice crystals only increase from the basal plane so that's why they acquire a hexagonal or pointed hexagonal ice crystal uh, shape okay so yes some some uh, scientists really argue that these ice crystals are uh, could be more dangerous than uh, the circular uh, ice crystals if they are uh, bigger in size but uh, the since the antifreeze proteins uh, keep a check on the size of ice crystals so uh, there is a kind of management uh, uh, on this ice crystal uh, morphology to prevent uh, the physical damage to the plasma membrane thank you thank you so much and i must congratulate you for this wonderful presentation and obviously we have always been congratulating you for your uh, phd work so uh, i think we really had a wonderful time listening to you once again thank you so much thank you yeah so dr gupta uh, mm. one of the students have asked a very uh, basic question mm. that uh, in some places where snowfall is occurring throughout the year or in the winter season so mm -hmm. how do plants have a very generalized strategy to avoid cold stress uh, so actually uh, the metabolism uh, in those plants is kind of very uh, uh, very less <laughs> metabolic metabolic rate in those plants is quite very less so mm -hmm. they invest uh, more of their energy in producing these uh, compatible solutes osmolites and these kind of antifreeze proteins and their uh, Uh, they invest uh, more in kind of this stress tolerance rather than uh, increasing their uh, productivity or increasing their yield so there is always a uh, kind of compromise between the yield and uh, this stress tolerance so because they cannot escape that uh, area they have to survive so they just uh, invest their energy in stress tolerance mechanism Okay. by producing some kind of compatible solutes and this kind of stress related proteins okay so are there any other plant systems very similarly growing in himalayas which have been worked out for this type of uh, afps uh yes uh, popular is one of them so popular uh, populus uh, uh, in populus trichocarpa i guess and if its activity has been detected uh, in so in himalayan region there are lots of populus and uh, so those uh, so actually uh, Uh, in himalayan populus and if like popular antifreeze activity uh, has not been detected yet but uh, in other parts like uh, populus harvested uh, 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 from russia and some uh, this nordic countries they produce antifreeze uh, protein so okay. yes uh, we can expect that uh, uh, the himalayan popular can also secrete antifreeze protein okay so thank you dr gupta for such a nice interaction and well this area is a never ending inquisitiveness to all the researchers so we can again interact in future rather he will be ready for any sort of interactions through his email id so thank you dr gupta from the organizers on behalf of jangipur college for such a nice presentation and sparing the time from the busy schedule for presenting us a wonderful area of stress biology so with these words i come towards the end of the section 2 technical session 2 now i will slowly proceed towards the validatory session for that i will invite dr chumki choudhury to address the validatory session and deliver the vote of thanks and during the validatory session we will be providing the feedback link in the google meet chat box as well as in the youtube link so i request all the participants to kindly fill up the feedback link and please take care of your uh, name and other details because that will be used in the certificate generation so thank you once again dr gupta now we proceed to the validatory session to over to dr choudhury thank you very much shomo uh, i am really glad to give 
the valedictory speech and the thanksgiving for this webinar. Life teaches us that success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue which counts. As we have come to the end of our today's journey of erudite discussions, it is the time for acknowledgement, valediction, and thanksgiving to all our fellow colleagues and the patient participants who have helped us to make our effort a grand success. In this course of thanksgiving, firstly, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our approbated resource persons who rooted us beautifully in their scientific thoughts and guided us to think beyond our boundaries. Our first resource person was Professor Zahid Hussain, who is the head of the Department of Botany, Kolan University, has delivered his talk on the topic, role of miRNA in abiotic stress responses in the plants. It is really fascinating to know the mechanism behind miRNA mediated regulation of gene expression to cope up with different abiotic stresses in plants. I would like to give my heartfelt thanks to Professor Zaid Hussain on behalf of organizers and all participants. Today, our second resource person was Dr. Ravi Gupta, Assistant Professor of College of General Education Kukmin University from Seoul, South Korea. He has delivered his lecture on the topic of delineating the molecular mechanism underlying freezing tolerance of a Himalayan shrub, Hippopyramnoides. His work is a really significant one as this plant has versatile use in food industry, traditional medicines, cosmetic industries, and has different ecological importance too. The information about the molecular mechanism behind freezing temperature tolerance by the plant will really be useful for the students, scholars, and the faculties who have keen interest on this topic. We are really thankful to Dr. Ravi Gupta for sharing the stunning scientific explanations with us. The decades long studies of scientists, including the recent Nobel laureates has proved that climate change is real. Along with the climate change devastation, direct human influences like pollution in different spheres is another important threat for the life and livelihood. Natural and man-made changes are leading to mass extinction of species during this Anthropocene era on Earth. Extreme Climatic events have brought changes like temperature rise, water deficiency, that is freshwater deficiency mostly, high salinity, increased light irradiation, and many other, which collide with abiotic stresses like heavy metals and other toxic pollutants. The combined effects result into complex harmful conditions that destabilize agricultural system and disrupting the ecological balance. Fortunately, knowledge of physiological and molecular responses to stress combinations and understanding the mechanism in genetic level can be the game changer. The input from our resource persons in this field are really remarkable. Now, this is the time to thank all the students, scholars, faculties, and scientists who have participated in this webinar from different states of India and different parts of the world. Thank you for giving your valuable time and made us feel contented. Now I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Abdul Kadir, Honorable President of Governing Body of Jungipur College and all other respected governing body members for their patronage. I would like to give my sincere thanks to the advisory committee members of the webinar. I like to give my sincere thanks to Dr. Nabokumar Ghosh, Secretary of Governing Body and Teacher in Charge of Jungipur College for his continuous support and help. I would like to thank IQVC Coordinator, Organizing Secretary of this webinar and Honorable Governing Body Member, Dr. Vikash Kumar Panda for being the backbone and the main patron of this webinar. I would like to thank our Teacher Council Secretary, Mr. Keshav Chandra Ghosh, the Assistant Professor of History, Jongipur College, and all the faculty members of Jongipur College for their support. 
it is my pleasure to express thanks and good wishes to my fellow colleagues of Department of Botany, Jongipur College, Mr. Shuman Karmokar, the convener of this webinar, and Dr. Shomo Mukherjee, the coordinator of this webinar, for their endless efforts. I like to thank Mr. Shivnandan Das, the graduate laboratory instructor of Department of Botany of Jongipur College, for his input. I convey my heartfelt thanks to all members of seminar subcommittee for their support. Finally, I must thank our technical associate, Mr. Srikanko Boshak, for handling all the technical details of the webinar. I really hope from now onwards, all the participants will share a bond of knowledge and especially the young people will be awakened and inspired towards practicing science. The last few hours truly felt like a concentrated dose of knowledge itself. Thank you all. Thank you very much and have a good day with the permission of our honorable TIC sir and our honorable IQSE coordinator. I announce the official closing of this webinar now. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>